school committee meeting for Monday, November 21st. Would you all please rise and salute the flag? Which is and out there. Outside. Outside. I pledge of allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'd just like to read the school committee statement. Is this on? The committee represents the needs of all Lemonster public school students and places their interests above all others. We will exercise leadership, adhere to our protocols, and base our decision upon a reasoned assessment of all available information. We will advocate for each of our schools and support high quality public education in Lemonster. Okay. Do we have a student report? Yeah, yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, because it's not on the agenda, but. Okay, sure. So, would you like to come up? Is it there? Okay. On our website? Is it? Hi. Hi. How are you? This is good. How are you? Good. Good evening, members of the school committee. My name is Kaylin Sharenza, and I am a senior here at LHS, and I am here on behalf of my AP United States Government and Politics class. For the past month, we have been learning how the municipal government works. We had Councilman Mark Bedanza come into our class and explain how our city budget works, and he gave us a brief overview of the school budget. After Mr. Bedanza's presentation, we had a number of questions about how the school department develops its budget. We asked Mr. Bedanza where we could find and obtain a copy of the fiscal year 2017 Lemister Schools budget. He did not have a copy, but explained that since it's a public document, we could obtain a copy at the library. The staff at the Lovemonster Public Library did not have a copy and directed us to the city clerk's office. The city clerk's office then led us to the comptroller, who directed us to talk to the school department. We visited the business manager, who at the time was in a meeting, and none of the staff in the, in the office knew how to find the budget. Prior to this, I had been in contact with the mayor and his secretary, who were both very helpful, and explained how the school budget should be on the school committee's website. After realizing the budget was not on the website, we went back to Mr. Fratto, who was more than helpful. He agreed to come in and meet to the class and discuss the budget. At this point, I would like to read you an email that, he had, that I had received from him. And I quote, I would enjoy meeting with the class to discuss the school budget. Please share times and dates for such a discussion. Prior to this discussion, I'll forward budget materials, the current year budget, 2015, uh, 2017 fiscal year. It is not available online, however, I will work on presenting a budget document that is easy to understand and provides timely information. He also sent me an email explaining how while this information is in its raw data, it may not be as useful to a high school class as other materials that he can put together. In AP government, we are being trained to think like social scientists. We are being trained to look at the data and make our own conclusions about what we see. So I want to be very clear that we are requesting a copy of the line item budget. While we appreciate the fact that Mr. Fratto has agreed to come on <coughs> December 2nd, we have yet to receive any budget material from his office. In fact, we have found it nearly impossible to get a hold of this document, despite the fact it is a public record. We do truly believe this is a matter of oversight and not intentional. We sincerely hope that this document becomes available online. My classmates and I intend to, present, to be present at the rest of the school committee meetings for the year in order to develop a better understanding of the school committee's role in our management of our schools. We also welcome any committee member who will be willing to come to LHS to speak to our class. I will leave my contact information with Mrs. Silverman, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So you were here more as a class on a, yes. uh, representing a class versus, okay, versus, versus the student council. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and just FYI, the school committee has not approved the line item budget for 2016. 17. And 17. Yep. Um, we are still working on it, so just so you know. It's probably but I do agree it should be online. Okay. Um, okay, Superintendent Communications. Yeah, there are no communications to the committee this evening. You want to do public comment? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is there anybody that would like to speak at the open forum? Sorry. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen. Good How are you? Good. Thanks. My name is Jay Cruz. I am the junior senior sharp instructor for the HVACR program here. For those of you that don't know what the HVACR acronym stands for, it's heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration. I am also the lead 
cluster teacher for the construction trades, and I'm here to speak with you about the initiatives in getting our school store open. Our school store will offer various merchandise with school logos on shirts, hats, and sweatshirts. We are able to get the initiative underway with the help of a wonderful donation from DCU, which I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, in the amount of $5,000. Today we have completed all construction of that store. We have also passed permit regulations required by both the building department and the fire department. Currently, the graphic arts department is filling the store with merchandise as we are proud to say that we are on schedule for our target date. We are hopeful that the grand opening for the store will be right before the Christmas break. This initiative will benefit our students in the arts of management, entrepreneurship, and business practices. The students will be able to understand what it's like to own a business by discussing the pros and cons of starting a business and owning a business. Additionally, they will understand products and services and the importance leading to distribution of that product. Our execution strategy incorporates proven methodologies, extremely qualified personnel, and a highly responsible <coughs> approach to managing deliverables. Um, as I'm sure you are aware, our shops follow a state mandate frameworks. These framework guidelines are and shall be used as, a pres as prescribed by our current curriculum in business and entrepreneurship. We are hopeful that our goal to produce successful business leaders of tomorrow will be met. With that being said, I invite you to the school, I invite you, the school committee members, to see what our students have done and what they will soon accomplish. I thank you very much for your time, and I wish you all a happy holiday. Thank, thank you. Thank you. you. you too. Same to you. Okay, anyone else? Oh. Hi. Hi. I'm uh, Dan Bashant, Assistant Director at the Lemonster Center for Technical Education. I'm here to just give you some brief remarks on a program that we're starting at CTEI. Um, we're trying to start our own 501C3, uh, which is one of the um, uh, autonomies that we have as an innovation school. So we've held multiple meetings with Linda Mack and the representatives of the Community Foundation of North Central Massachusetts. And we're in the process of starting that 501c3 which will benefit all of our school programs projects and student scholarships the name of our program is the star program star is an acronym for success through alliances and resources and this will help perpetuate the mission of CTEI you can look online we've also got a go fund me account if you'd like to make a donation to help us get that started, it's www.gofundme.com backslash CTEI star dash fund. Any contribution would be appreciated and uh, just one of the many programs and things we're working on at CTEI. So thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Dan. Good evening. Okay. Sandra. How are you? Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so, as part of our plan to sustain and improve student performance, we're in collaboration with Carl Pimarini from LTV <laughs> to create and implement a television program promoting the 12 CTEI Chapter 74 approved programs and the students enrolled in those programs. As you are aware, we have a dedicated <laughs> staff of 18 academic teachers who work closely with the 30 vocational instructors to provide a high quality, well-rounded curriculum. We were able to take a tour of the facilities last Thursday and we found them quite impressive. State of the art, technologically, sophisticated equipment, including staging, lighting, and editing resources. In the short term, beginning in January of 2017, we intend to use the newly renovated garage to film grade eight students choosing to take a voc ed course as one of their electives. The ultimate goal is to expand filming to include all CTI students on a Monday through Thursday schedule and taught by a teacher who was specifically assigned to instruct students in the process of television production. It is very exciting. Any questions? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
I'm okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Sam Orlando. I'm an electronics teacher at the Center for Technical Education Innovation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, with the emphasis on innovation. I'm here tonight to talk to you about one of the best kept secrets in Leminster that everybody should know about. You guessed that it, it's CTEI. <laughs> we want the Leminster community to know that we are not a diamond in the rough anymore. We are a diamond. And we want everyone to know about it. Uh, you want proof? Talk to our students that go on to rewarding careers of skilled work or further their education in technology, science, and engineering. Uh, is proof that we're doing the right things at CTEI. But we do not rest on these successes. We continue to innovate. <clears throat> we want to engage more students at CTEI. We want to introduce more students to prosperous and rewarding careers. One of the many new initiatives at CTEI is the eighth grade training program and facility. We've managed to secure the funding to convert <clears throat> an unoccupied uh, garage on the school's campus into a 1,000 square foot classroom. The new program will be taught by CTEI instructors from the electrical, carpentry, plumbing, and health occupations on a rotating basis with the help of current juniors and senior students. The goal of this new program is to help incoming freshmen have a better idea of possible career choices even before arriving at CTEI and create a familiarity with the working in a high school setting. Staff at Somerset and Skyview Middle School are in the process of determining which students will take part in this course, uh, which will begin as an eight-week pilot program starting in January, February 2017 timeframe. Each participating student will be bused to CTEI from their middle schools twice a week. Based on the success of this pilot program, we hope to expand the number of eighth graders being accepted and broaden the scope to include all the school's vocational shops. Uh, please stop by CTI office and learn more about this and other initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? One last time. Anyone else like to speak at the public comment? Okay, we'll move on to Item two, presentations. Okay, so here we are tonight. We have a uh, school committee workshop this evening, so we'll loosen up a little bit and try to make this as interactive um, as possible. We're still kind of in a business meeting mode, but we'll try to um, interact a little bit uh, more freely than what we typically do in a, in a uh, general meeting. So um, we're focused on education innovations in the limits to public schools this evening. Uh, the committee is familiar with each of the innovation topic areas based on previous presentations, but the intent of the presentations uh, this evening is to update committee members and the public on the progressive work in each area. We're going to try to limit our presentations to 15 minutes so that we can uh, keep this as succinct as possible. Uh, we do have principals here and they are moving in and out to get uh, to this meeting and then back to parent-teacher conferences. So please be uh, cooperative and understanding that if people are moving in and out of the, uh, of the room. So from an overview standpoint, uh, the district has implemented some exciting innovations in public education over the past five years. Uh, the obvious successes are on the agenda this evening. The opening of two innovation schools, one new school, that has taken root in the community is, and is experiencing growth and one school that was transformed into an innovation school and has established itself as, with a firm foundation for schools uh, for students in vocational technical education. We have experimented with new models and individual academic planning for students, uh, real world learning through internships and co-op opportunities and different approaches to traditional status quo classroom learning. We have implemented and accelerated the platform for virtual learning through a collaborative partnership with FLAC, and that product is Ingenuity, as well as we continue to sustain um, virtual high school and Edmentum as a uh, additional virtual learning environment, and we're continuing 
to work on refining those platforms. We have worked outside of the standard operating budget by partnering with the Lemonster Education Foundation, or the LEF, to fund innovation in our classrooms through our annual innovation grants to teachers, as well as the implementation of the LEF Express vehicle that has placed the mobile classroom on wheels into the community. We have implemented the Parent Information Center to centralize all student registrations and welcome parents to the City of Lemonster and the Lemonster Public Schools. The PIC has helped us to focus more succinctly on school choice students and related data to reduce the number of students leaving the school district. We have forged ahead in our support of students for high quality career and college planning and preparation by creating our pathways for the 21st century which is focused on career, college, real world learning, again through internships and co-op opportunities and student employment, and really building the connections and the um, uh, business community relationships necessary to open up those doors to our students. We have implemented uh, and experimented with various approaches to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math through implementation of parent, I mean of uh, Project Lead the Way, gateway to technology and the introduction of programs on global sustainability and we're looking at the creation of maker spaces in the district. We continue to focus on innovative ways to approach the development of early learning experience for all children through early childhood education initiatives. So that's a snapshot and an overview. So what we'll do is move on to the individual uh, presentations and discussion. Uh, first being uh, student analytics uh, with Steve Mamoni, who has been heading up that project. And I had also sent you a diagram of how this kind of all interweaves through um, the innovations interweave through uh, the district and connect with one another. So as we have these presentations, please feel free to ask questions or uh, address uh, any concerns you might have as we move forward. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hi, Steve. Hi. Well, Steve, <laughs> if, if everyone can, as we go through this, if you can speak to the sort of the numbers, like does this affect the whole school or is this 100 people, 20 people, 30 people? If everybody does that, it gives us a better sense. Um, the numbers of staff participating, Whatever. using? So okay. if it's students, how many students? There's 600 students in the school and there's 200 participating. Nice. Just gives us a better idea. We got it. Sure. Yeah. He passed him around already. Okay, Chris. Oh, Chris. It's okay. Thank you. Just had a Okay. <coughs> I had a coughing spell. So um, tonight I was going to speak for um, about 15 minutes, try to keep it um, brief if I can. But please feel free if there are questions along the way. Um, I, I prefer not to just talk about the program. Um, this is part of an ongoing effort to use data to improve student achievement. Um, if you look at um, the second slide, there's a uh, just a tie-in to the district improvement plan. So um, we are building assessment literacy. So it's it's talking about the adults that work with students and how we're building their data literacy, how we're increasing our own professional knowledge around using data. And so there's two ways to do that. One way is to make the data more accessible, and then the other way is what are we actually doing with the data and how are we using that to improve our instruction. Um, so if we keep that in mind as a focus, I think that will help. Most of what I'm talking about tonight is around the accessibility of the data. Um, in years past, some of the difficulties, and I believe this is one of the reasons that Jim prioritized this, the superintendent prioritized this, is because he realized across the district that there, there are so many sources of data, um, but the data is housed in a lot of areas. And so Baseline Edge, which is the computer program that we use, is now owned 
by a company called IO Education. So if, if you hear IO Education, we used to just call it Baseline Edge. Baseline Edge is the computer program that we use. It also is the program that we use for educator evaluation. So teacher evaluation, observations, goal setting, all of that is housed in Baseline Edge. There's a whole other side of the software that's um, student analytics. And that's what we're taking a look at tonight. Um, so on slide three, you see we just have a quick introduction. And then there's a few components I wanted to call out. There's an individual student profile when we're looking at the um, data itself. And then how we, dis how we can display information, how we can filter information, and then maybe some time for questions. This um, software is used across the district. So all of the administrators are trained in the use of the software, both in the observation side of it, the talent, so the talent ed, and also the data analytics. They are, um, uh, as well as the entire staff uses the observation side and the analytics side. So there's, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, so tonight, like I said, we'll talk about the, the data side of it. Do you have like an example? Did you run a couple of profiles that you could share with us? I'm showing screenshots tonight. Um, the live part, I'm still trying to work out. The live part has student information on there, student names, student faces, and those kind of things. And obviously I can't display that with the television camera. Um, but I have screenshots here and examples for you. So in a future meeting, um, I'm working with the company to try to identify ways to do that. If we can't use our own data, then I can use some demo data and show you similar things that we do. But if you want to, throughout the course of this, identify things that you would like to learn more about, I'm sure Mrs. Silverman will be able to record that. I can do some research and then we can incorporate that into the next part. If well, I, I, guess the, I guess the question would be, how, how do you assess this at the end? Like, how do we know as the school committee? Yeah. Because I think we have a long-standing trend of implementing these sorts of things and then never really not getting to know at the end what the actual results are. Sure. And where we stand with them. So that that's I'm sure that's what the data is here. Then you're going to yeah. pull from that and so use that to guide you through progress. Correct. Yes. The measure of, of how data is used is, is challenging. How do, you, how do you measure the effect of the use of data? That's, it's hard to quantify that, um, but what I'd, what I'd like to say is within our school groups, and maybe, maybe I'll talk first and then come back to that, but I think seeing it in the groups and the, effect in the effectiveness of time, energy, and then efficiency, I think, leads to where this program, it, that's where the, the bang for the buck is, um, in the efficiency of the data use, maybe not necessarily, um, it's, it's hard to tie it directly to the student achievement piece because there are other ways to do it, but it's around the efficiency of accessing the information. Okay. So let me talk a little bit more and maybe um, that'll raise more questions. The first part is an individual student profile. So at any particular time, a teacher or an administrator can go into this program, call up a student, and have all of their assessment history on one screen. In years past, we would have to go into the Dibbles website or into a paper folder, but into the Dibbles website, get their Dibbles data. Into the MAP website or NWEA, get their MAP score. Into the state website to get their MCAS or their PARC score. So it was, it was pretty time consuming, and we found that maybe that wasn't happening as frequently as, as um, it should have been. So when, a, for example, if a teacher is going into a parent meeting, they can go into this, into this part. They're very familiar with logging in for their own goal setting and evaluation. They can click on a student, and the example is um, on the next page, but they can, you can see the information that they have. So their individual profiles there. Um, maybe back, Tim. Yeah, back two. Back one. Yeah, right there. Sorry. One more. One more, yeah, there. That's the one. 
So in the individual's profile, I took a screenshot, I blocked out the student name and the photo, um, but you can see this one has map information and it has historical map information. So you could go down and get a quick glance of their map progress. If I scroll down, I could look at other assessments. Right, Steve, we're sure. one quick thing that just pops. How is this entered? Is somebody having to Hand feed enter, all this no. in? Or? Nope, so this, this information for this particular test the, and is on the NWEA site. The district gets a, an electronic file and then we upload to the site, secure upload, and then it gets integrated. It uses the student ID mm -hmm. to identify which student that data belongs to, and then it ties it all together. And we can tie in the other tests, the park tests. Exactly, the, the state tests sends tests us files them. for those. We have access through the Dropbox. We can, we can take care of that. And so it's all tied in through the student um, identification number, and then what we do at the school level is, I say, okay, the upload went through, let's, periodically check, go in and check five kids at each grade level to make sure that the picture's right, that the student information is correct, those kinds of things. It's, um, it's pretty streamlined, which is nice. Good. One thing I do want to say, the advantage of using a program like this is sometimes we get so, um, so intense on looking at the data and looking at the numbers and trying to find solutions that it's possible to lose the lose touch with each individual student. And so one of the nice things that this program does is it has the student photos right there. And so it allows for personalization. It allows for um, staff to take a look, see the individual student there, match it up with the data. And, and I think it's a much more personalized approach. If we take a look at um, the next slide, Mr. Blake, this is an example of my entire school. And you can see there, I, I took the large shot so you couldn't see the individual faces, but I can zoom in from anywhere from one to the 694 students that are, that are in there. And then what I can do, if you look at the next page, it has the filters. So I can filter down, drill down deeper around a lot of the demographics so I can take all the males in the school. I can take all the male fourth graders in the school. I can take all the male fourth grade special education students in the school. I can take all the male fourth grade special education students who might also be ELL. Now I have a real um, simple way, and that took as, as quickly as I said that is about how quickly I can do it through this program. It's clicking filters on the screen and I can, I can narrow down the data that I'm looking at. Um, then I can display the information. And so I can display that information based on those criteria. And then I can add other criteria. I can look at that for one particular assessment or I can look at that through multiple assessments. If I wanted to, <coughs> if I wanted to look at, I think the example is on a couple more pages, so I'll, I'll come back to that. I can, what I do in, in the school is I project up onto a wall, have the data team sitting around, we pose questions, we um, come back with questions from a previous meeting, say we want to look at this information, we throw it up on the wall, and we brainstorm and we change the criteria as we're sitting there. In years past, that took a lot of paperwork, a lot of times, and if you've been here a while, you know we used to do that with post-it notes. We'd have the colored post-it notes up. We'd have um, the, the war room, the data walls, and now we can do that electronically. <clears throat> Sometimes it's good to have the post-its and, and do that by hand. But in terms of the efficiency and the time saving, this is a, a nice way to do that, a visual way. Um, so we bring the projector right into the data meetings that we're having. Then there's, there's an example of park scores. Um, the, just for your knowledge, the, the shots with the close-ups of the students, that's the demo data from the system. So it's Longleaf Elementary, it's a made-up school. Um, so if you can see student faces on there, then that's the, that's the demo data. But the ones that are really tiny pictures, those are the live Lemonster data, but I zoomed in and you can't see those, so I think we're good. Um, 
Some of the things that I think are important, you can create groups of students and save those for the future. If I have a Title I teacher that works with a particular set of third graders and I want to periodically check on their data, I can identify them, save them in a group, go back and check on them later so that teacher has that ability to do that. And that's probably where we are in the process. Over, we've done an overview with the entire staff, district-wide. Teachers have access. I think they are comfortable to go in and look at an individual data, piece of data around a student. I think administrators are comfortable going in and doing some of the things I'm talking about. And then the next step would be, how do we train some of those teachers to get to drill down into that? Steve, one, one okay. quick thing is. Ladies um, first. Are you going to be able to do this from year to year? Like if you create a group this year, can you access that group next year to be able to compare as they went from third grade to fourth grade? Yeah. You, you, you knew where I was going with that question. <laughs> I read your mind, Ronnie. So the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, a lot of the groups at the elementary level are not that static. Mm -hmm. um, so the group changes quarterly, right. um, if not six weeks right. at a time. So um, that may not be what, what we want to do, but it's possible to do that if a group um, remains together. Mm -hmm. Some of those grade level groups that are in second and third grade with one particular teacher because of the special education um, a resource room, for example, the teacher could track over multiple years. The data is in there and the data gets uploaded. So we have MCAS data from years past. We have the park data that was when we tested park. We have maps. So now we're starting to build a historical um, platform so you can now go back a little bit further than we could and a lot easier than we could in the past. Um, <clears throat> like I said, it allows us to have the data in front of us and then the educators know what the intervention should be or know what interventions we're going to try. We have um, a flow chart. Okay, this student is showing this weakness area in terms of their Dibble scores and their map reading score is also um, indicating that they need some intervention. Let's, let's design an intervention for them. We'll try it out six to eight weeks. We'll come back together as a team. So this program doesn't design the intervention. It doesn't tell us what to do with it, but it allows us easy access to the information so that then we can spend more time talking about the individual student. The, the last big thing I want to talk about is you can do this across multiple assessments. Um, and the example I have, maybe another one, Mr. Blake, another one, yeah. So we're going to take, in this example, um, a student that has low or low average score on the MAP assessment and a Dibble score that has some risk. So that group of students, I can take them, I apply those two filters, they pop up visually into different groups and I can go in and I can select them, I can design intervention for them. And it's as easy as the first two graphics at the bottom of that screen, sliding the bars um, and, and selecting what my score points are. And so if I'm in, if I'm in the room with, with the adults, I can say, okay, we've got, we, these are our criteria, and it comes up and there's 100 students that meet the criteria. Well, we, we can't find intervention services for all 100 of those, so we're, what's our target group? So we slide, the, um, we slide the target until we get a group that is workable, and we start intervening with those students. Sure. Um, so the pictures are popping up, and is there names attached to those pictures? So you're not like absolutely pictures, names. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like this. Yes, pictures, names. And teacher um, or anything like that. If I click on the on the picture, then I get the individual student profile that has the demographic information. Quickly access their student his, um, score history. So very accessible um, in terms of that. And then how far back does it go? <clears throat> Right now, we're, we're back, I'd say, a good three or four years the comfortab comfortably. Um, at different times, we've used assist assessments differently. For example, um, the MAP assessment, we may, not have, we may have given it once when we first started. Now we're giving it twice a year, sometimes three times. So those kinds of things we need to just take into account. Um, I'm excited about the um, having a data analyst back on board because if you look the next steps, that's one of the things that 
Um, I do want to talk about the, the data analyst moving forward with that, getting that person up to speed. I can have a partner again um, <laughs> talking about the data and making sure that we're good there. The other things, I'll be one sec, Ron. I'm right with you. I got you. You're next. Um, the teacher assistant teams, that's an example. I believe there's some efficiency. That's a pre-referral special education process that we're mandated to do, and I think in Lemister we do that extremely well. But I think some of the forms and some of the paperwork that we use, there's a way to um, make that more efficient through this program. So we, I've talked to um, Mr. Pratt. We're looking at that. Is that something that we want to do as a district? And then we can integrate our standards-based report card at the elementary and middle school level into this program. That data is in Aspen. It's in X2. We can take that, push that into this program, and then we could start using the standards-based report card information as another assessment qualifier, which I think, I think, really think teachers will like that. Um, that you know, which standard, which standard is um, across a grade level student, our students having difficulty with? And how does that look in relation to our, what our MAP scores are telling us? Okay, Ron. The <coughs> So the color coded, uh, do they, how, do, okay, yep. imagine I was, I was supposed to look up this, and I wanted to look up, you know, I think she was asking about grade two or grade four, you know how last week and the week before, we were talking about how even though grade four is here and grade five, is, grade five is here and grade yep. six, they're the same kids, but different years, do you have that, do you have it on here? Yeah. Is it color coded? So it is visual with the student pictures. Um, with within the bar graphs, okay, like the example, and within those, the pictures can be then color coded depending on the um, the level of the student, a low, an average, or a high student. So within the bar graphs, with the student photo, those can be color coded. Um, but then I can export any information that I farm out. I can export that into Excel, and from Excel, then I can create any type of visual graphic that I need for other purposes. So this program doesn't do that, but the ability is there. To make it easy, is it horizontal? Or is it vertical? Once, I, once I have that data in Excel, once I, I could do a scatter plot. I, <laughs> once I have that data in Excel, I could do any type of graph that the user needs or wants to display information in, in any way. So, I mean, basically you're collecting data, and, and it's a lot easier to manage because it's all in one place. So I guess my yes. question at the beginning was, okay, Everyone collects data today. It doesn't yep. matter what you do with it. So now that you know, you've been into the database, it tells you a story about either you're drilling down to a particular group of students, looks like they're struggling in a particular area, now you're going to formulate a plan based on your data, correct? Exactly. And you're going to monitor that and assess it, and then does this give you the opportunity to put that data back in now, saying we identify these students, there were 50 students, and out of that 50, Two of them we got back on track in two weeks. Another ten it took uh, three weeks to do, and then we got five here. Yes. So that's the important thing. I mean, everybody collects data. Yeah, that's what you're doing. that's critical. And and depending on which assessment we're using, so at the elementary level, I'll throw out Dibbles because we're all familiar with Dibbles. Dibbles progress monitoring. So if we've used that to identify third grade students with oral reading fluency that is below benchmark, and we're going to put them into an intervention group, use a program, teach them, and then we're going to progress monitor. So either weekly or biweekly, and we're going to then check the data. So can I add progress monitoring data to this system? Absolutely. And that's what we do when we meet as data teams. So we have different levels of data teams. There's a school-wide data team, and then we have an interventionist data team. Now at each school, it's going to look a little bit differently. At the elementaries, it looks kind of the way I'm describing it because that's how we're set up in terms of using the dibbles. The middle school, their assessment team might be looking at the map information a little bit more and then drilling down using that. Um, some of the interventions that we use, like Lexia, would have their own assessment built in. But that it's that, it's that frequent two to three week 
check in to, to make sure the intervention is moving students because if not, we don't want them in there for the eight weeks. We want to move them onto an assessment that's going to work. And that's why I asked. When I said an example, yeah. I don't want to see kids' pictures. I don't know their names. Yeah. I want to see the, da the data. As an example, in other words, we took this many students. We drilled down. We found this particular area, reading, math, whatever it might have been, retention. Yeah. And we, we looked at that. Here's the problem. And then you follow it all the way through to the end where you end up with hopefully 100 percent right? right so growth can you do that absolutely yeah yeah that would be just interesting and so this is the tool to do that this is the tool to uh, monitor that right um, this isn't the tool that's going to tell us which interventions or anything like that this is the tool that's going to help us um, organize make the data more efficient have access to it for more people i think that's where we are um, this allows many more people to have access to the information in an easy, understandable way than it than we did before. So how long before you can have, uh, so you, you basically, this is the first step, is, is this database? This is year two, so we're, we're moving pretty well. Like I said, once the data analyst is on board, we'll tighten everything up, and then I'll move forward to make sure that we do a little retraining, everyone has access to the information again, because I think the more frequently you use it, the better. Um, the the better you're going to use it. And then, so in what year would you have a, would you be able to close the loop on this? So you have a full, you know, you have a end-to-end -end from input to the output of the data to show this is, this is where the problem was, we resolved it, this is how long and yeah. how many students it affected. I think that, um, I'd like to say that that process, probably quarterly, use, the use of this program is, is cyclical. It's going to always be at, in the fall, we're always going to do this. We're going to upload the spring data right. and the new fall data, and then we're going to look at it. In the winter, we're going to upload the new winter benchmarks. In the spring, we're going to upload our spring data plus the state data. If it's there, if not, that'll be in the fall. And so that's going to happen every, you know, yearly, um, throughout the year. And so I think that now that the state has their state assessment schedule, now we're tied into MCAS, that's, that's going to be the thing for, for the time being. Right. I think we'll be in a much better place with that. Because we'll have consistency. Consistency that. around that is going to certainly help us. So you're saying you can generate that anytime? It's an ongoing thing. It is ongoing. So you could generate an example now, then? Depending on what we set for the criteria, which right. assessments we are. We just finished up our, our, um, map. our map. Yep. So that data is just being um, finalized, loaded up, and then uh, on the map, we have to close it out at the district level first. Right. Every, all the schools are done taking mm -hmm. MAP. Now make sure it's all done. The makeups are done. Then MAP certifies it. And then we'll get the file and upload it to baseline so it's accessible. In the meantime, people can still go to the MAP website, NWEA, and access the information. Mm -hmm. Not in a nice, neat package, though. Yeah, um, no? I, heard, I, I heard you speak that you know elementary and middle school. What about high school? Is high school going no, to be able to? Absolutely. The high school has access to it. Um, and their, their term their grades data are going to be loaded into it? The, the, we're not doing the term grades yet. We're at the state um, score level. So the MCAS, the PARC, and then the, reta the retakes, all of those, ki but their those kind of assessments. But will eventually, all report cards will eventually that's, be loaded into that? Because that's possible. Because some kids, some kids do well in class, but not on a t standard yeah. test. Absolutely. And, and so the possibility is there, but... That. You know that's um, that's a tier tier two maybe mm -hmm. part of the project. I th we're not there yet, but the ability is there to do that. Do you have anything? Uh, yeah, I just have not so much a question, but I just want to say, you know, I think data analytics and the ability to look at each individual child and try and understand how they're testing and how we can intervene. I think that this is an amazing program, and I really hope that we have the ability to expand it in the future. Thank you. And I, like I said, this is the tool, but the, the focus, as Jim has outlined, around the district improvement plan and our direction is right on. That's where we need to be. We need to be looking at, obviously, big picture. But I think we do the big picture thing pretty well. You know, we can identify standards at a particular grade level in a particular school, and we can work toward making sure the curriculum's aligned and those kind of things. Now it's like, what does Johnny need? You know, what does Sarah need? And what do they need today? But then what are they going to need in three weeks? You know, and I think that's important, critical. Monitoring, like, how often a teacher is looking at each of the children's profile. Like, you know, just I would imagine there's some kids that are going to garner more attention than 
others, but I want to make sure that sort of everybody's reviewed. Yeah, and I think the data teams in the schools do that. So the school-wide data team and then the individual um, groups that work in. In our school, it's the school-wide data team. We sit down and we come up with a plan. All right, which students? And then, you know, we're still using some of the things that have worked well over the years, and then we're identifying them, and we're touching base. It's a, there's a lot of communication um, from when you get to the data, from the data to the, the teachers. And it's, is the interventionist talking to the teacher? Is the teacher talking to the instructional aides that also work with the student? And all of that communication is critical. Um, you kinda, it's kind of like the, the band. You know, you have to have all the pieces playing together in order for it to work. I think the only other thing to add, Eileen, to, to that question is the fact that we're also, uh, Steve's been working to get the attendance data up also because there's a direct correlation as right. to where the kids are coming to school on a regular basis. Right. And which tip of, uh, typically exemplifies their um, ability to continue to learn well in school. So can't quite overlay the social emotional pieces yet, but maybe at some point we'll be able to do that. But right now attendance is a, is a big, uh, a big uh, identif yeah, uh, identifier of that. So. I think this will give okay. us a lot of data to, um, that we've asked for in past years that will be we'll be able to have quickly and uh, have it be accurate. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, Steve. Steve. Next is Tim Blake. Hey. Yes, sir. Before we go any further, there's three kids over here. Are you guys leaving? They're from, they're from the Lovers High School, mm -hmm. and they're part of the AP. They're AP in the government. AP government. And, you know, indulge in me, OK? I would like to have them here just so they can have a sniff of what's going on instead of being sitting over there. Is it okay? I think they're probably happy sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking of going and sit over next well, you know, to... Just a, I just think that, you know... I think that was well said, Ronnie. <laughs> if they want to be up front, they should be up front. All right, so second, uh, Tim Blake is up, and he's been assuming um, a lot of the responsibility. We had a, a teacher previously handling um, most of the uh, management of our virtual and hybrid learning in the district. Uh, that individual uh, left the district during the course of the summer, so Tim has uh, stepped up to the plate. Um, right now, we're using Ingenuity, which many of you know about because we've been talking about it for the last couple of years as our main platform for virtual and hybrid learning platforms. Uh, we currently also had, have Edmentum, which is the old Play-Doh uh, software uh, located at the high school, and we've continued to sustain that primarily uh, to support the Academic Learning Center, which Ned and uh, Chris Lord will be speaking to um, last on the agenda today, um, as well as we're using virtual high schools. So uh, uh, Tim's really been the uh, leader at Skyview Middle School on the implementation of Ingenuity. We're moving towards implementing at Samoset, um, but Ingenuity has not only supported our world language program, um, at Skyview, but also um, a lot of the summer programs that Tim implemented this year for our um, promotion policy that was passed by the policy subcommittee last year. So we'll turn it over to you, Tim, and you can speak to uh, the yep. virtual learning. So um, I don't want to short sell myself, but I'm not going to be the probably the you know, the key member of the Ingenuity sales staff. I do want to give you a kind of Ingenuity at a glance about kind of what they do because they do more things than they've done in the past, so they have a lot of things they can do. I'll talk a little bit about what it does um, in my building and kind of what our next steps are. And obviously, Jim, you can jump in at any time if you have anything to add, and if you have questions, I'll zip it and we'll go from there. So Ingenuity used to be more of a like middle school or high school platform, but is now a K through 12 platform. Uh, the K through five platform was Compass Learning, which I believe was just newly acquired by Ingenuity. Uh, not only do they do K through 12, but Ingenuity has dual enrollment options through Sophia. They have 
hate to say whatever type of course you could think of, they pretty much have, but if they're offering middle school and high school courses and dual enrollment courses, they have pretty much any sort of course you can think of, including elective courses. Um, their courses can stay as a standalone, credit recovery, hybrid learning experience, homeschool platform, or a curriculum supplement. You pretty much ask them what they can do, and they will make an offer for you if it's through licenses or the standalone course option. It seem to be kind of the more traditional two. Um, their interventions align and work with MAP. Um, for them, that's called their My Path program. So similar to what C was just talking about, you give them data, they work with some you know, nationally known data sources, you give it to them, they say this is what the kid needs. That obviously doesn't replace teachers and parents and families and kids' intuitions, but it's another data source that you could use if you wanted to. Uh, Edgenuity teachers are licensed educators, so these are licensed mass teachers. The teachers run office hours that are not always during class time. Usually when people first start using Ingenuity, that's usually the first kind of like hurdle just to kind of get through because you're taking a class, but your teacher's not always right there like live talking to you. Uh, for example, in the middle school, we have a rotating schedule. So if my class is at 8 o'clock and then the next day it's at 9, then the next day it's at 10, uh, you can bet the teacher in the back end who's working with a million school districts isn't saying, oh, excuse me, Tim, I'm going to move my office hours to 8, then to 9, to the 10. That's not how it works. Um, but they do have, kids do have direct communication with their teachers. Uh, grades and gradebook access are available for students and families. Uh, parents like that, obviously. They can get in and see what the kid is doing. They can have direct communication with the teacher. And the teacher can have direct communication with the kids. The curriculum is NCAA approved. If you work in a high school setting, you know what that means, and that's a good thing. If you don't, that means you've, uh, like Tim Blake, made up a course about something he likes, and you took my course, and you loved it, and your friends loved it, that'd be fantastic, but most colleges probably wouldn't care, even though you would love my course. Um, so NCAA approved is a big deal. Um, Ingenuity can also be utilized as a summer school credit recovery program. We'll get into that in a few minutes. And their summer school program has tutoring available to kids. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, currently at Skyview, we have about 120 kids enrolled in foreign languages. That's our greatest use for us. Kids take Spanish, French, Mandarin, German, and Latin. Kids get to choose whatever language they cho want to. Uh, students access classes through a Chromebook. And on that Chromebook, they also have headphones, you know, like earbuds you see other kids wear, but they also have ones that have a mic so they can speak back into it so they can do the talking part of their foreign language. Um, for us at Skyview, we do have one classroom, which is de a dedicated ingenuity classroom. It has a Chromebook cart and a full-time tutor. So basically, what they, it looks like a traditional class in the beginning, like the kids have something to do right when they walk in, and then it's unplug and off they go. Uh, the kids do work at their own pace. Uh, sometimes they work at different spaces, not confined to the classroom. Now that we've got a wireless upgrade, we actually can do it all in one classroom, but the kids still kind of like being out in the hallway to do it, which is cool. Um, Besides the foreign language piece, we have 25 students who are offered summer programming through math, science, English, and social studies. Again, there's any sort of courses they could need to make up, but we did the four core academic. And the summer programming took place outside of the school setting. How so? And, uh, as you say, and did we find that those who took the summer programming um, no. basically did enough work so that they so the next page and the next slide. Sorry. That's all right. I just not like you got it ahead of time. Right. So six students took and passed summer, scored, uh, summer courses. Eight students were retained in grade level. I did include it. Of those eight, four have left the, left the district. Eleven students were promoted to the next grade level and currently taking a previous grade level class to complete promotion requirement. So of those 11, some families opted not to. Right from the beginning, we met with the family saying yes, no, they had the reasons, different and varied. So some of those kids are moving up and they're you know, not minus a grade level class, but they had to lose either a workshop class, which is to help, we don't like taking that away, or they're not taking art, music, and those sort of things. Tim, I, my question was gonna be, it says summer program took place outside, how so? At their house. You, you'd let them take a Chromebook home, or? The, most, of the, most of the families had a computer access or internet access. And if they didn't? And then we had one family who did not. We signed them out a laptop, and that's what okay. they used. And so when they got ahead of them, am I over-reading this or under-reading this? I don't know. If they got ahead of their, their grade requirements or classroom, what happened? Um, that was not a concern. It was keeping pace. They didn't get ahead. 
So they needed to keep pace for their summer program. They didn't get behind. <coughs> no. I mean, I mean, in terms of if you're taking like getting ahead, like ahead of their pacing, or like took too much. Yeah. Whatever, whichever way you want to interpret it. I would say of any kid that was not a problem. The problem was doing their work, not getting ahead. If they got ahead, they get a high five from me. To be quite honest. Well, you know, I mean, I, I realize I'm getting people to laugh at me, but no, that's not the point, Ron. But my question is, if they get, if they still something's not moving ahead. Yeah. What happens? Then they're done earlier. That's fine. And what happens? Yeah. What happens? What are the complications? What are the implications? So if for done if, if for summer school classes, if they're done earlier, then they're at grade level and they're done. Their application. Right. Then they move on. Right. Other than if you wanted to give them another class or they wanted to take something That's else, exactly right? Where I was another, is there other courses available in the That's summer exactly that they where could I was take? To. So in the summer, what we were concerned is more of a credit recovery. Mm -hmm. You failed math. We want you to pass math. But if down you, the road, there might be more of a library of other things. They might get excited and say, hey, that was a pretty cool way to learn. Exactly I'd like to take another thinking. course. Down so the, in the future, you might be able to offer those. Well, it's like anything else in life, there's a cost. I mean, it's right. something that we could work out. Ingenuity itself has you know, courses right now, K to 12, you name the level, you name the elective. So if a kid identified that as a way that they want to learn, anything's possible. Right. I think what always Ron was asking is, what happens when they reach that level? And your answer was, well, they've reached it, we're happy. But if the student says, look, that was pretty fun, I learned, uh, is there another course menu that a student could take? Barring the I know the money, but that's always an issue. But, yeah. but are there other things? If the student said, I want to go, I want to keep going, I want to go to the next level. Mm -hmm. I, this is my way of learning. I'm really having a good time that's with exactly it. What yeah, there's absolutely a possibility. Okay. Have we had that all happen all yet? All along, some of them attract them, right. and all of a sudden mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like sugar for the brain, and all of a sudden they want more. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the purpose of these presentations at tonight is to open up the committee and the community's eyes to what we have available. As the mayor said, everything has a cost associated with it, but if this is something that it, I think, I went back to my entry report when yeah, I came I in as slide. superintendent, and this was one of the key areas that I identified that was going to be a important trend for the future that we need to open up our opportunities for virtual and hybrid learning and this mm -hmm. has been a major success for us Wendy? so far so but just to clear this yeah. particular thing you're telling us about was students who would not have been able to move on if they didn't pass a course so if yeah. they were just given this course if yeah. they finished early then they had the rest of the summer to yeah. have summer vacation but the whole point was just mm -hmm. to be able to move up a grade level with their peers and finish yes. this course so I think what we're, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I think what Ronnie or Dean are talking about, if you look at just the, the previous slide where you got kids enrolled in Spanish, French, Mandarin, German, and right. Latin. And That's optional. If, I mean, it's a different cohort, but if you're thinking of that group, of, that type of learner, and they really like it, what else can I do? Then, is it, you know, it, there's uh, tons of possibilities of what we can do. How do they assign a cost? Is it by licenses, or how do they assign another Per ones? course. So it's per course per person? Yeah, so it's, well, per course, per person, like any other good sales program, they'll they'll make a plan for what you want. They can do licenses, you can do per course. For right now, with the number of students that we got for Skyview, it makes sense to do per course. So give me an example, like, um, what's one of the courses you said that, that uh, Spanish is one of the, or French or Mandarin, yeah. German, Latin? So yeah. what's the one that has the most amount of students in, in the foreign language? I would say, oh, probably equal, I didn't bring numbers of those, right. probably about the Spanish. All right. So how many students would you say are in Spanish, uh, By grade level, so if I got about 120 kids, I'd say probably about half. So 60. And That's real rough. I'm not betting no, any no, no, of my no. I'm not, no, <laughs> houses not, or children or anything. There's not going to be a test. So, <laughs> so there can be, but I just don't have it here. What's the 60? What does it cost to um, to sign 60 students up for a, a full program? I can tell you in the summer, hmm. which I know is not what you're asking, it's about 200 a course. So I can't remember if for the foreign languages, if it's the same cost. But I'm it, guessing it it's probably not. Yeah. And how it's long does that Spanish course last? Semester. Definitely. It's a whole semester. But they have like level, like you take middle school French 1, then middle school French 1B, then middle school 2, then 2, it, there's like 2A, 2B, high school 1, 2, it just keeps going. So it's not on demand. You can't watch it at, you know, if, if I'm a person that sleeps late and I want to watch it at, you know, no, 11 it's, at night. It's, it's on, on demand. demand. 
It's on demand. You can take it whenever you want. So they don't all have to be watching it in the summertime at 9 in the morning. No. So $200 isn't bad at all. So for the kids right there that are on their Chromebooks right there, um, one of the challenges for the teachers are the, I hate to say keeping them engaged in class because they're engaged in class, but there's nothing to prevent them saying, I got something else I really need to do. I'd like to do this later. But they're trying to keep them on pace. Tim, I'd like to ask, during the summer, yep. is there anybody within the school that's monitoring them that they're, they're doing the program? Is there something that you can go in yep. and see that um, John and Kate and Tim are taking their courses and you know they're working on it? Or do, do you need to make a phone call to their parents saying, you know, they haven't been oh. working on it or? All the above. I mean, I'm basically the, the monitor of it. Mm -hmm. When I say I'm the monitor of it, if you're behind pace by the standards set by the course mm -hmm. and the teacher, which is a little more complicated than I just glossed over, mm -hmm. um, you're getting an email. Uh, <laughs> Nona, you're 10% behind. Yeah. Make sure you're putting this much time in. The email okay, to Nona is. I'd like to know that it's being monitored. 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 Yeah. yeah. So are yeah. uh, you students already doing this? Have you taken I'm these? Not, but None of I, these guys I know. I know friends. Yeah. Actually, one of the students who just left is taking uh, computer science and um, through a virtual high school class. And there's a bunch of other seniors. I could start listing off names, but that's No, no, nothing. Well, who's the but, name? <laughs> the class? So yeah. these are options. In other words, they're taking them because they want to. These are, they're not taking them because they have to. But they're, so, so are they comfortable taking these courses? I mean, have you taken one? I haven't personally because I'm a CTE student. Right. So I really don't have the time in my schedule. But um, see, CTE is driving them really high. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is what we're here for, guys. <laughs> no, no, I'm just interested no, no. in it. But uh, the um, the friends that I have like heard talk about, they they enjoy it. Really, and I have a friend who's currently. Mm -hmm. You do have to get it right. done on certain times, but right. you're able to do it in the time that you have to do it. So it gives you a week to do something, exactly. and weeks up, it's off. Exactly. And you and you have the entire week to do it. When you choose to do it, it's your choice. It's got to get it done. That, kind of like that freedom of, like, right. it's my decision to do what I want, when I want to do my work, and how I'm going to manage my time. I think it's a lot. It gives us a better understanding of time management. So we're not like, okay, you have to pass in this paper at 11.59 tomorrow. And, and so, mm -hmm. is, is he take that course optional? I mean, yes. is that voluntary for him yeah, to take um, it? It's not required by our school to take it, but it interested him, and he. It's an elective. Yeah, it's an elective, and Dean, it's something that he wants. Some of the kids who can't get into a particular AP class, right, because we'll take it. because they you know have other things scheduled like band mm -hmm. or whatever, yeah. they take it. They take the virtual high school AP, whatever the class is. And you can also um, take the test too. Right. Even if. Right. right, right. But I, I guess what I'm looking at is, so it, it seems as though there's there's people are comfortable with this kind of a format. Mm -hmm. Well, not everybody, but some. And so, and and w w is most of this voluntary, rather than mandatory? So because for foreign languages, for anything. I don't mean just language. It's voluntary. Uh, so most everything is voluntary. Mm -hmm. And and then that must be, that must be, um, contributing to to, to the. Um, student success overall, right? I mean, if you're talking about student mm -hmm. achievement, if somebody's taking economics, or they're taking an advanced economics, mm -hmm. and maybe whether it's not something we offer here or something that wouldn't fit into their schedule, that's obviously going to help there, mm -hmm. right? So it might be worth an investment in the future. I know you, I see your next steps here. Your last slide is yeah. where do we go from here? Um, so I think one of the things that the students have brought up is. Uh, if there's something there's interest in, there's a way to do it. So while it's a little bit diff different to manage at a middle school setting, you know, anything is possible. Um, could we give kids some more choices and just it's how you manage it? It's absolutely possible. So right now we're just doing it with foreign language, but there's definitely some more choices out there. So if, Steve, if you want to keep going. Um, currently right now I meet with FLAC and representatives from Ingenuity District Network meetings to learn about how other, other schools use Ingenuity. I have an overview meeting with uh, Dr. Lord behind me in Ingenuity on December 7th. Well, Ingenuity will go over some of the things they do and we'll be able to get Dr. Lord's input and feedback. 
about how that might work. Same as at middle school, has the, the potential to do the exact same things that we're doing at Skyview. Uh, they just need to take some steps and meeting with their staff regarding future uses of it and like rooms and technology dedicated to the program. Um, we'll need, a, I would say, way in the distant future, probably an overview meeting with Ingenuity and Compass Learning to better understand the things that they do in the elementary school setting. Um, it's not that it's altogether different, but it's, you know, elementary school is different than secondary school. In secondary school, it's more, middle and high school, it's more you know, kind of course by course, and sometimes it's recovery or, like Nona brought up, I can't get to that class, but I can take it here. Uh, where I think in elementary school it will look a little bit different. So are you happy with the recovery piece? Yes. That seems to be the area that you seem to be using this. Well, I would say we get a lot more kids in foreign language, but I think in terms of summer school, I've seen summer school right. programs. I'm, I'm happier with just after one year what this offers than what I've seen in past in multiple districts. Okay, good. Well, that's good to hear. I just have a, a, a joint question of um, homeschooled students. Are they being encouraged to use Ingenuity versus another packaged homeschool program? Well, most of the and cases our homeschool um, applications come in with their own curriculum. We review the curriculum and approve it and they move on. But what we've done with every homeschool letter for the last two years is marketed Ingenuity to them. If they do opt to take Ingenuity, they have to register as students in Lemons to Public Schools. Yeah, okay because then at least we receive the mm -hmm. Chapter 70 money mm -hmm. for the student, so then we in turn can offer these courses. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I can't allow them to, um, access, to it, access right, yeah. Ingenuity at our mm -hmm. cost right. when they're not right. willing to pay the okay. cost. Right. In some cases, we've worked out arrangements with parents and students for certain courses, but um, we've had a number of homeschool students who have registered with, with the district mm -hmm. to to access the virtual learning. Okay, so. and the other one, which I'm sure there is not any out there, but for um, students that are on a long-term OSS mm -hmm. status, they've, they've utilized they're this. using this. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, That's uh, is, one of the academic supports that NET is incorporated into so someone um, is the academic support pieces. Monitoring them using right, this. Right, exactly. Okay. Yep. So my only other thought is that, uh, to me, it would be really important for um, parity that everybody has an opportunity. So it doesn't seem like Samoset students have the same opportunity as Skyview students. Mm -hmm. And to me, that would be something we need to focus on. Yeah. Um, I think that was in the goal here, right? Right. That I mean, that's goal. next steps. But I really think we mm -hmm. need to, you're already into year two. And this, and we really need to get that moving for yeah. them. And we've had those discussions mm -hmm. with so. All right. Other questions? Ron had a question. Yep. You're not missing anything. We're dealing with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed on those type of hybrid situations. Okay. This is all new. Um, okay. The individual so that I work with right. at the department um, looks at us as really being leaders in this area, so when we're they, working those things out. When so. they go to graduate, because as you guys were talking, I was trying to roll this out of my head. When they go to graduate, what kind of, what kind of, what, what kind of, what kind of diploma? What kind of diploma do you get? I, th I think they have to choose. Yeah. They mm -hmm. have to make a decision, like who, any like any decision? any child that goes to an out of district school. Yep. They have to make a choice. Do they get the 
diploma through the out of district school or do they get a, a Lemonster High School diploma? Or do they do a high school equivalency? Right. Most of our homeschool students do a high school equivalency and they base their, their um, uh, they propel themselves into college based on that. So. All right. I mean, this is the next you're, generation is the generation that's going to probably get their seven, degree. There's something you want to say. Go ahead. Okay. To He's not used to having people agree with him. Pick their head, pick their mind. That's all. He's not used to having people agree with him. When you're saying that they, they, have a, they have to make a choice between this diploma or that diploma, how is it going to interfere with their going to college or college well, that's or their choice. That's their choice. Well, it's, 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 asking, it's their choice, their a choice. diploma. A diploma is a diploma, and all, all colleges recognize a diploma. Each family. Each family. Families are the family will, make the family will choose that. And what have they used as their decision making? Oh, Whatever they want, Ronnie. Ron, it's, it's what's comfortable. Look, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Ron, Ron. Basically, they, basically they have the option, uh, uh, you know, per family on how they want to pursue this. So some families get into the system, they get out. They're partially in. Some of them play sports, right? I, I think they yeah. can play sports. Well, yeah. So there's a bunch of different options, and the Department of um, Public Education leaves it pretty open-ended. So if a parent says, look, I'm worried about whatever. I'll worry about college later on down the road. They can. And they can go to a private college that doesn't care about, you know, what their MCAS results were, if they passed it or not. Exactly I mean, yeah. I was so there's all kinds. The career decisions later on are career decisions they make later on. Right. It's but personal. Yeah. But family decision. Right. Just, just having worked with it when I was at the high school dealing with graduation, we had out of district students that elected to get a Lumminster high, high School diploma and they were allowed to come in and participate in the high school graduation. Other, other students chose not to because they never attended Lumminster High School for any type of course. They were in an out of district program their four years and they wanted to graduate in the environment that they attended. So they chose to go to that out of district school and get that out of district diploma. So there's a lot of options. They've left a lot of well, flexibility in there. But it, no. but it all counts Those as a diploma, questions. and all colleges recognize that. But it sounds to me like your generation, it just sounds like a generation of students who are more comfortable learning in that kind of an environment. They're, they're more so at the risk of making myself feel old, when, yes. you talk to the, to do that. when you talk to the kids, they like it. You talk to the parents. Sometimes they say, "I don't get everything they're doing, but I get, you know, I get the emails, and they they seem to like it. They're happy, and I can see their grades." But also, the, happy. The, the teacher in the classroom only has so much time to spend with the student. So, it, and, and 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 that's by day. By I mean, we're in two half days now. Yeah. We're going to be on vacation. But get for, it back. A day to wind everybody up again. So, that really this sort of goes hand in hand with it because it's, if a student really does get it as economics, for instance. If you only can get so much here because this, that's all the time there is, a student could get take advanced courses. Yeah, right. I, I think in one thing you should. I, I said it, and I don't mean to gloss over it. For Skyview, we have a tutor in the classroom. Right. Why is it a tutor versus a teacher? Because there's 25 kids taking five different courses. Right. The teacher isn't really standing and delivering in a traditional classroom atmosphere and environment like many of us are used to. She is facilitating things happening. And I don't want to belittle what she does, but it's different. She doesn't teach 20 minutes of Latin and 20 minutes. It's no. they all come together. They start with the focus, and then off you go. But I'm just saying, if you really like the subject and you want it to progress, you can keep and going. exceed even what is yep. the expectations to get a degree or whatever. Yep. You'd, you'd be able to do that in this scenario, or something that's just yep. fun, right? Or just you just want to take something that's just seems to be fun for you. It, it's learning, but it's not anything that's a requirement to take. Yeah, we, we got a middle school kid that, you know, between Colleen and myself, we'll have to check into to, to talk about exactly what Nona talked about. I mean, that student's taking all their classes online to the, and taking German. So they're taking the core academics and taking German. And, you know, those are all real high school, you know, real middle school classes. So the future really is more virtual crossing over in a whole right. lot of places, yeah. right? It's using mm -hmm. Well, if you use the, medias. if you think of that foreign language class, there is a possibility to have more classroom areas in a middle school level where I'm the teacher and you three are taking one class and you three are taking another class and maybe you guys are all taking 10 other classes and I'm really there just to facilitate, make sure everything's happening as it's supposed to. So it's kind of a different concept. And sometimes you don't need a teacher-teacher like we're used to. Well, they're nodding their heads in 
sort of excitement, as if yeah. uh, we struck a nerve here. That it just seems to be something that. I told I, them to be excited. I, I think it'd be. I think it would be. If I, I don't want to derail the whole meeting here, but I think in a future meeting it would really be helpful to get maybe a couple of students to just come in and talk about their experience on yeah. taking. Mm -hmm. You know, either remedial if they want to comfortable talking about it, or Probably just electives. <laughs> I know you might find somebody that says, "Look, I was," you know. I don't think so. I think you get that foreign language one would be better. Yeah. and and so they could talk about their experience mm -hmm. in this and how maybe it helped them to become more interested or just pursue their passion. I think the important thing is once they get into college, is their college experience is going to be all online anyway. So yeah. we're just, we're or a combination getting, of the two, right? Yeah, we're just getting them to a point where they're going to be more comfortable with that setting. In so. fact, I think what the, the federal government has said is, look, when you, in the future, you, you spend the thirty, forty thousand dollars to go to a college. Why don't you take so many courses online, and then why don't you do the rest mm -hmm. of them? In the mm -hmm. right. Sort of like what a community college does: you take courses at community college mm -hmm. that you need your core cur uh, courses, and then you move on up to you know the university, where then it costs. A my classes are online through Northwestern. I'm getting the same degree as somebody who's right. on campus, Absolutely. but my cost is a no, fraction no. of what they're yep. paying to go. Okay. The young lady on the end. Yeah, you don't have the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never seen it. I've never been on campus. But it's really nice. But cost efficiency. I'm getting this. My degree will be the same. Yeah. At a very small piece of, and it's right. a good school. So when you go to apply for a job, they're not going to ask you right. whether you took it online or not. That's right. not going to be a requirement. I think she had something she wanted yeah. to add. Um, A lot of online courses, you have. There's a certain amount of, you get so much credit for uh, participating with interaction with your with it. I like it. I'd, I'd like to hear from some of the students just to get their sort of spin on it in terms of what they why they took the course and what they got out of it. If they think it helped them towards. So you could be taking college courses right now in high school, basically, right? Yes. And those would count. That's what yeah. I was leading. Yeah. That's a dual enrollment type of pieces we can look at. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, so, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Thank you. Jim, just Thank one you. question. Yeah. Um, so, this is replacing Play-Doh, which we just renewed the license mm -hmm. for. Or? No, this no. is um, we we entered into the contract with Flack on Ingenuity to be able to support the uh, progress that we wanted to make at middle school. Uh, the Play-Doh has been in place um, to the support the Academic Learning Center at the high school for a period of time to avoid making all of those staff members switch to a new piece of software um, immediately and go to Ingenuity. We have uh, extended that, that license for another year. They were able to make a pretty good deal with uh, Play-Doh, which is now Edmentum. So we've continued that for another year, but that's why Tim and uh, Dr. Lord a meeting in December to start to look at the progress of evolving that into um, ingenuity during the course of uh, next fiscal year in order to avoid the ad additional costs for Edmonton. So. But is this company local? Are they ingenuity is based in Arizona, but they're nationwide. So. Thank and they have the biggest school districts in the country right now. They have Miami-Dade, they have uh, Chicago Public Schools, they have New York Public Schools, so they're a pretty big company. So. And Thank you. And Lemonster. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. But this is an equalizer. It doesn't it matter is. what school. You could go to the best school or you could go to a, you know, yeah. one of the poorer ones in the Rust Belt and it really wouldn't matter because matter. you all have the same, same access. Same course, same. Right. Right. Yep. Thank you, guys. Right, so next is uh, career in college. Uh, Trish Woodliffe is here again this evening. She this done, better be as interesting as you're being, she done a, uh, <laughs> you're being uh, evaluated. Uh, you set the bar for any packets today. Your what? emails are free. No Trish, no Trish emails. She did a uh, presentation on career in college minutes. earlier this year with the school committee. But um, one thing that we hadn't touched on was the use of Naviance, which is a piece of software that has been in the high school 
but it really hasn't been, uh, the use of it hasn't been accelerated at the point where it fits into our plan for 21st century pathways. So I asked Trish to come tonight just to make sure that you understood that piece of software. We have a couple of students nodding their heads already. They're familiar with the software, and uh, we'll let you take it from here. Thanks. Uh, and I didn't plan that, but girls, anytime, feel free to jump in, right? So I appreciate that. So covering tonight, uh, Naviant and ILPs, individual learning plans. So just to cover Naviant, just to have a better understanding, we introduced Naviant into this district through Title I funds a few years ago. Naviant is an online software. It's a website that students can create their own accounts. Every student uh, in Lemister High and CTEI currently have an active account. So students have their own um, accounts where they can do some self-exploration. They're also looking at doing career exploration. They're also looking to use those uh, tools that are online, not just for college planning, but also that career exploration. So Naviance is just, that's a Cadillac version of how uh, a software to utilize to, to do an individualized learning plan for any particular student. So currently at the high school, as I mentioned, we're talking numbers with about 1,800 students, give or take. They all have accounts. Guidance counselors have worked an enormous amount um, put a, a plan together and done some significantly heavy lifting here in the district and have worked with all the students to get them to have active accounts. And then a piece that we're working on now is to take that heavy lifting off of our guidance and putting it into a whole school culture, right? So um, we've had some professional development opportunities where all the faculty have seen the dashboard and kind of taken a look at what this Naviance is. Um, staff and guidance again, taking the heavy lifting on doing some individual small group training with our faculty up at the high school uh, and professional development opportunities to really figure out how they can embed this uh, online platform into their classroom. And I will say that, you know, CTEI and in their planning, and this really aligns with their career exploration, have taken the lead up here at the high school with their team uh, under the guidance of Mary Bellata and piloting a pretty comprehensive ILP plan. So what does that mean by comprehensive? That means they're breaking it out by grade per student. So in ninth grade, they have a list of responsibilities um, and expectations that they have for all ninth graders to be in their online accounts and work through and navigate. And they're all building on top of one another. Tenth grade, different level of responsibilities, eleventh and so on. Um, and, and really it's a guiding document. It's student driven. We can list a list of responsibilities, but the students are really the ones that are in there navigating next steps and really hoping it to be a guiding document for course selection, right, um, and plans beyond high school. So we're also looking at it at a district of rolling that out into a middle school level and what does that look like, okay? So uh, we're doing a significant amount of research not just to get access to the software, okay, um, but also what does that look like for professional development support, and what does that look like for all of our middle schoolers to, you know, transition to any three of our ninth through 12th grade options with transferable information. If they're already working in their Naviance account uh, and they get to carry that with them to the high school, that's going to be a pretty powerful tool. So. Uh, we're also leaning more towards, you know, really shifting up at the high school on the Lemister High side of the building, taking this off of guidance, I emphasize that, and also the career exploration. This is not just a college inventory tool. This is not just to expose um, or plan for two or four year colleges. That's in addition to. There's a much more comprehensive uh, database and resources and career exploration. The goal behind co um, college and career readiness, or what you'd hear Superintendent Jolliker talk about as uh, 21st century pathways here in the district, the overarching goal is that our students are leaving here with a, a diploma and needing no remedial. So whether that's no remediation when they go into post-secondary training, where they go into college, where they go in the workforce, you know, we're talking about being ready. Not everybody's gonna figure out what they wanna be when they grow up, when they leave our high schools. I'm still sorting that out. Um, I'm still sorting it out. But we want to make sure that they have skills, 
to navigate that, right? Navigate the, um, the real world and navigate and apply those to real world applications and um, figure that out, whether it be in post-secondary or workforce, and then maybe they return to post-secondary later on. So looking at it down at the middle school, that's gonna, we're, we're currently working with them to figure out if we're gonna do an eighth grade model rollout just to kind of pilot this, or if we're gonna do a full sixth through eighth grade um, plan for a rollout as well. As we continue to support and strengthen it at 9th through 12th grade, as I said, you know, CTEI really has quite the task force um, and they're navigating this pretty well. When, and we have the infrastructure set up on the LHS side of the building, but haven't quite maximized an opportunity um, as well as we could for students to utilize their Navion software on a regular basis. Yes, Nona. Um, speaking of that, Mm -hmm. um, how does a student who has a seven period day, who has seven classes, there's no free time, mm -hmm. when are they using Naviance? How are they using Naviance? No, good question. And so, you know, on the LHS side of the building with that seven day schedule, um, seven, excuse me, uh, period schedule, guidance counselors went into their social studies classes and used a block throughout their social studies mm -hmm. period. Um, Yes, you can permit. All right, so and they're told taught me the truth. how to do it. And yes, yeah, yeah. How so to navigate through it. They walk through it. Uh, guidance has really also developed under underneath the guidance lead, um, Megan Diacentis has really put a, together a comprehensive curriculum mm -hmm. throughout the guidance department at every grade level. So when they're going into social studies classrooms, um, it's pretty scaffold and, but strategic. When they're going into classrooms, they're looking to you know set students up as a freshman with their accounts walk them through it, do certain activities, and again, having bullet points of, you know, the things that they should be doing. How about CTEI students? CTEI students is really, that's embedded in actually their faculty. So their instructing staff have already jumped on board with that and have a pretty significant list of responsibilities um, and tasks at hand that aligns with their, you know, the obligations of kind of their post-secondary reporting anyways. So they, they've done that, they've had, you know, they're moving that into their, their vocational programs as well as their academic programs. So their, their stu a CTI student is learning how to do this in their shop class? Or? Yeah, my understanding and really the idea is at the end of that is they'd have a, a, a portfolio, mm -hmm. right? You know, so and I know Mr. You know, Dave, Mr. Fandaka can speak a little bit more to that later on when he comes up, but that there's this display of, you know, this capstone, if you will, of their four years or their three years in their shops and through the use of building a portfolio with this platform. Naviance is really just a tool how you utilize it is, you know, and, and various, yeah, you so can use it in various ways. But in the example. high school, if I'd like to nudge, it would be great if we had an opportunity, uh, 15 minutes or so, um, that students could be in a small classroom size or a classroom that would support um, students to be able to get onto their Naviance accounts and utilize it. So they have the same access. Just just and same exposure. Coincidentally, if uh -huh. you take an example, a sophomore CTI student, how much would they have been exposed to Naviance? Depending, but they should have met, that sophomore student should have met with their guidance uh, or should have been in a social studies class and they should have uh, an account, they should know how to get into their account. Um, and I'm not quite sure that there's a there's a regular schedule right now for that sophomore student to um, have a supported time during the school hours to utilize it, uh, other than what guidance has been rolling out in their classes. But this is also accessible after hours. Correct. Yeah. So in open house, we spent some time, um, you know, and, and introducing this to parents and guardians that were coming to open house to understand what IOPs were, right? Because we that acronym, by the way. People are really confusing it with like IEPs, right? So special education world. This is not unique to Lemister on this one, guys, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a commonwealth issue on some common language. And for that reason, we invited um, folks out from the department to, uh, to come out and actually speak to our, all of our faculty in regards to what is an individualized learning plan and what isn't it. Um, so yes, Nona, I, I too think that if a sophomore on uh, Lemonster High um, should have ample opportunity within the school day to be supported. I think we'll be, be supported. A, a particular sophomore student mm -hmm. if he's been using it. And if, <laughs> and if that, 
<laughs> so I, out of curiosity, you bring up a good point, and I know you know we got. I'm going to stick to my time. I don't know about those middle schoolers, but I am an administrator. <laughs> I'm going to stick to my time. But I will ask why, while I'm up here, though, um, ladies, if you if you've had an opportunity to utilize Naviance, and um, and if so, would you? support an opportunity to utilize it more during the day during the hours that you're in school uh, definitely because um, I'm in CTEM in health occupations and uh, it really helped this year uh, each year I can remember being pulled into like a media lab or having um, a guidance counselor come in and like show you how to navigate so even if you happen to forget that year they come back and they uh, show you again but uh, this year alone um, our, the guidance counselor for uh, health occupations completely came in and showed us like um, they have like th these like quizzes that um, like you can look at careers that are like uh, good based off of your personality. She also helped us um, to use it for college uh, research and stuff like that. And I can personally say that Naviance has really helped me kind of figure out what career I want to go into and what colleges offer this <coughs> career because. On my own, I've been kind of confused, and Naviance has helped me to like figure out which colleges um, best suit my needs. Mm. Next job. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I really agree with what she says. Um, along the lines of every year, we're kind of like introduced into that Naviance just a little bit more in depth. And this year, especially considering we're seniors and we are applying to college, it was definitely like useful to have that extra time to be pulled in and just kind of be like, hey, like this is what you can do. This is what Naviance offers what you do with it is what you want, mm -hmm. but this is what we're like going to help you with. And it was nice because there's a certain aspect where you can compare colleges and mm -hmm. you can look at the retention rates, the tuitions, because like like you all said earlier, money is a big part in everything that <laughs> happens. And mm -hmm. so you're able to look at that. You're able to look at the student ratios, um, and it was just really nice to see the colleges mm -hmm. that I wanted to go to and all the statistics all in one page. That's Not only like that, but yeah. it's. Um, it's really a great place to get specific with colleges because it has literally so many options of like what a college offers for example like um, what are their views on uh, LGBTQT oh my gosh LGBTQT rights mm -hmm. so if you're a strong supporter for that you can click that this is needed at your school mm -hmm. and they'll bring up schools that have that and you can also uh, put in your major too and it'll give you schools and um, you can select where you want to go to school and it'll give you schools that support those rights and that have your major and are in that region and it just gets more and more specific and I think that's pretty important. So it's user generated. If you, you use it, you get a lot out of it. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the back, the, I guess the, the foundation is there. Mm -hmm. It just, right, the information is there. It's what you do with it. Yeah, and we're looking to scale that up. I mean, out of curiosity, I mean, you've mentioned you were at CTEI. Are you? At so, as a Lemonster High student, that side of the building, you know, what are what are the opportunities that you have to utilize Naviance, and then what would you prefer to have? Yeah, I like how you said earlier how we can have like a little time during the day in order to go on to this because mm -hmm. my, I mean, I'm not in CTI, but my schedule is still packed with mm -hmm. a decent heavy course load, and it is hard to find time during the day. And some students, if they can't do Other prior commitments, school is a good time to be able to use this and have time during the day, whether it be a 15 minute homeroom block where you're able to go on, or end of the day, or sometime in your day where we can incorporate how, or if we're able to get on. That way, every student is able to get on and not just outside of school, because right now it's more of an outside of school basis when the guidance counselors aren't coming in to talk to us. So it'd be very useful to have time during the day that we are able to get on what they offer because it is such a useful site and such a helpful site for especially seniors going into their college decision making. No, I appreciate that. And so you're, you're right, Mayor. Honestly, the platform is it's self-driven, student-driven. We're looking to scale that up, though, so there's direct correlations into student success, right? That's the piece around this. And if we can do it younger and younger, then kids are more apt to really start those planning stages where they're not just figuring it out in their senior year. 
Thank okay. you, Trish. Mr. Lodge Thank back you. there Quick saying question. he's a Marine, so he wants you to Trish. get up earlier. <laughs> Quick question, Trish. So is your hope bringing it into the middle school that by the time then they get into the high school, it'll already be habit for them and it'll be easier exactly. to get them to do Absolutely. it? Absolutely. It's about awareness, right? So the, the, the things that a middle school student would be doing in Naviance are going to look very very different from what they'd be doing you just if want they were them in ninth grade. It. It's awareness. It's about having account. It's accessibility. And it's about transfer of information. So when they get up to the high school, whether they get to CTEI or if they go over to LCE, they're familiar with what individualized learning plans are, right? They're familiar with that, and they're also going to be expecting to have an opportunity to be in that Naviance account, and that's what our goal is. All you Thank have to you. do is make it Less like social media. They'll be checking it all day. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Trish, 14 minutes. Good job. No, it wasn't, Trish. No, I don't know where you're counting, but it wasn't 14 minutes. <laughs> So this is not much of a workshop because the only people who are working are the person sitting here. So I'm going to make you work. Ah. So does anybody know the secret to giving a really good high five? Looking at your elbow. <laughs> okay, everybody has to stand up and give at least no, two really this good is, high fives. This is regression. <laughs> this is regression. <laughs> We're, re we're regressing. <laughs> this is distraction. <laughs> You're all up here, quite frankly, falling asleep. So I'm not going to sit Nobody here and has fallen asleep. Huh? present to a bunch of people who are falling asleep. So, um, thank you. So, Carrie, do I need to do an introduction, or are you just no, going to take over here? That, that was it. So, you guys know that at LCE, we are um, we're all about social-emotional learning, right? That's one of our primary goals, and we're also about getting kids out into the working world and having real-world learning experiences. So, in Massachusetts, we're really good at testing kids on all of the regular things, math, ELA, social studies. We got, like, some of the really most rigorous state standard tests, Woohoo! right? What we're not good at is measuring how kids are progressing in their social emotional learning, even though we know that that's what helps kids be ready for success after high school, right? Helps them be life ready. And we're choosing at LCE purposefully to teach kids social and emotional development. So we had an opportunity to develop a research tool to gather some data about that work that we're doing. Um, I'm not even going to give you my PowerPoint slides. If you want them, you can ask me for them later. Um, enough death by PowerPoint. <laughs> so we jumped onto the Micker project that um, Trish and Jen Mundy did so much work to bring in. What that project did is it partnered us with a researcher, um, Michelle Knight Manuel, who is a professor at Teachers College in Columbia. And we <coughs> spent the better part of a year trying to figure out what it was that we wanted to know and how we were going to measure it. So. If you think about social emotional learning, there are, it's, it's like any kind of curriculum. There are lots of different ways that people look at those competencies, how they qualify those competencies, what they call them. Um, so we tried to figure out, first of all, what model do we want to use? Big picture learning has a set of non-cognitive competencies that they look at um, that are, they've been, they've been using them for a while and kind of looking at them in their, in their programs for a while. So we jumped on the coattails of that. And we decided that we wanted to look at two in particular. Um, one of them is pretty obvious for us. It's knowledge acquired in or about a field. And it refers to an individual's ability to learn from experience outside the classroom using less traditional methods that are outside of the education system. For example, internships and projects <coughs> that are developed in those internships. The other thing that we wanted to know, and this was, this was kind of hard because we don't have any, anything for sure that tells us this, but we're pretty sure that one of the things that derails kids um, that come and work with us is competency number four, which is preference for long-range goals over short-term or immediate needs. Right? So that refers to how well an individual is able to respond to deferred gratification while planning ahead and setting goals. This can include quarterly or yearly learning goals, daily work goals, post high school goals, long term vision. What we know about our kids is for many of them, whatever is going on inside of them immediately in that moment, be it dysregulation, be it outside stressors, like I gotta get my kid's daycare voucher all filled out or I'm not gonna get that, you know, I gotta get the paperwork in for that, it's due tomorrow, or I lose my daycare voucher and then I can't go to school. Those things, when kids jump on those, um, it can derail them from, from staying true to their goals. So, 
we worked um, to design a research tool. We gave it to, we did both a survey and some interview questions. Um, the survey we gave to most of our students. The interview questions we just did with our ninth graders because um, kind of the purpose of our, our study is to see how our students are evolving over time once they've been at LCE, once they've been in the program, what progress are they making. So we're looking at collecting some longitudinal data as well. Um, what did we find out? Um, we found out that there is a strong correlation between the individual learning plan process for our kids. Um, and it's often expressed by, from the IOP process and how kids are feeling that their education is individualized for them. And they often express that as a demonstration of care. They feel care for at our school. Um, and that's, you know, that's great. Um, Long-term goal setting, we still have some work to do around that. We have a lot of questions about, um, our, our survey tool actually left us with as many questions as it did data. Um, but we're kind of wondering <coughs> how kids are interpreting that long-term goal, right? What does it mean to have a long-term goal? Because for some kids, it's really different, right? For some kids, it's about what am I gonna do for the next hour. For some kids, it's about what am I gonna do for the next week or the next trimester or the next year. Um, we also saw that students were able to name structures that they have in place um, to help them overcome obstacles, right? We talk about like if you've got an obstacle that comes up and you're trying to keep on your path, students are able to name some things that they have in place to work through those. Um, and we're starting to see some themes that are emerging when students talk about knowledge that they're acquiring in a field. So some of the themes include, and I can't even read this, I printed it so small. Um, like vocational knowledge, but also some of the, the softer skills that kids are needing, right? Like being on time, being able to talk with adults even though they have anxiety, um, those kinds of things. So we're, we're gonna like see if those themes continue and how they emerge over the next few years. So what does that mean for us at this point? Um, we're really grateful to have the Micker project. Um, the support of these folks, you know, we sent off all of these taped interviews that Pam carried out. You know, Pam has, a, has an EDD, so she's accustomed to doing these kind of interviews. All of those transcripts went, they went off to, to Columbia University, they transcribed everything for us, and then Dr. Knight sat down with one of her research assistants, who's a graduate student, and they looked through all of this data um, kind of on our behalf, but we, we looked through it as well, and then we're, we're now like kind of comparing notes. So what we've figured out is that um, as of now, you know, what we're setting out to do, we're doing, you're right, we're getting there. Um, and that we still need to have, we needed to emphasize this year, and we knew this going in, that we needed to emphasize every year, every student in the building getting an internship. Um, at this point, I think we only have six who haven't been placed. Um, so we're, we've really, we're doing a great job over there. Um, and that our next work is really about developing those rigorous projects for kids to do in their internships, because that's gonna give them more understanding of the actual learning piece, right? The knowledge that they are acquiring in the field, both the skills and um, and the, the dispositions, right, that they need to have to be successful. Um, so that's what we're focusing our professional development on this year. And we're pretty happy. Okay. You got us back on the rail. All right. Yep. I'll give you one more piece of information that is um, kind of cool. Uh, there's some folks through Big Picture Learning who have developed uh, with Salesforce uh, web-based a uh, tool called Imblaze, and it's basically a place for us to upload all of our data of every opportunity that kids have to get out and to speak with adults. Mm -hmm. So it's a management tool for that. Kids, can, kids will be assigned accounts. They can go in, they can see what internship opportunities are available. Can I, they can then ask permission to get in contact with people, like all the contact information is there. And then once the kids are in their internships, they'll actually be able to, on their phone, check in at their internship and um, the location for the GPS through their phone or if they're on a computer, the IP address from the computer will actually say, yeah, this kid was actually at Jenny's when they checked in on their phone. Um, not at Lemister House of Pizza, but at <laughs> Jenny's where they're supposed to be. And then they're yeah, they also- They might have been applying there. So, mm -hmm. you know. And then it'll ask the kids, um, 
you know, what do you, what are your plans for today? What do you think you're going to be doing at your job today? And then at the end of the day, there's a place for them to enter in and reflect on their day and what they learned. So it's um, it's in the beta phase. We're really excited. They've only chosen a few schools to test it out, um, and LCE is one of them. Mm -hmm. right. Clearly tonight, yeah, you should learn one lesson out of all this. Come up with a platform or a database or some other application because that's who's making all the They're money. They're listening. Right. That's who's yeah. making all the money. By the way, we get to test it for free, so. That's good. Free is always Thank good. You, Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. Thank okay. All right, David, you're up. Mr. Fiendaka. Well, that's going to hand off some paperwork to you. I want to get uh, your last slide in here. Turn the projector on. When, I mean, uh, since when Thanks, have Lord. you <coughs> gone on board at CTI? I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Full service. Thanks, Cloud. Dave, when yeah. you were a kid, did you hang around at Putts Bowling Alley? I did. Did you remember a guy named Flash? Uh, yes, I did. Do, Do we know want his to last know Flash? Name? <laughs> What's that? Do you know his last uh, name? I don't. All right. Shouldn't we this publicly, though? Yes. <laughs> Somebody might be watching that knows this. We're like driving ourselves crazy for years trying to figure out his last name. There's a guy that hung around there all the time. Yes. Nobody this can figure out his last name. By the flagpole we never know what happened. When you walk in the flagpole, it's right around the corner on the left hand side. There's a roll down to us, so you might yeah. not have seen it. Good night. Okay. Look like a garage door. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, all right. Just hit the button, it should yeah. turn back on. Okay. Okay, uh, before we begin this presentation, well, it's going to start to warm up. Do okay. so. you donate a vehicle? Okay. Yeah, we did the veteran's vehicle. They did a nice job. Nice. We'll bring it up. Here. Christine, you get fourteen minutes. I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. How many more do we have? We have two more. David, do you need help advancing slides? I know. Glenn, can you help David out? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> do you mind if I talk? <laughs> Yeah, that was a joke. All right. That's fine. Uh, so before we actually begin uh, going through the slides and everything, uh, one of the things that uh, the mayor brought up this uh, this evening was how many students are you working with? So I wanted to, it, it reminded me, I just went back to the office during one of the presentations. This is a list of all of the freshmen that go through our um, freshman <coughs> tech awareness program that have IEPs. So when our freshmen, and this, this comes to about 250 to 300 students. So when they, when they come to us as ninth graders, um, and it ties in with what Steve Mamoni was talking about first thing tonight, because we, we need to know something about the students when they walk through the doors. And very importantly, when they walk into our shops, we need to know people, uh, our students who need help, who have uh, special things that we have to watch out for. And so our special ed department works all summer getting this ready for us. Once we know who our kids are coming in in the ninth grade, and they put this together for us. Uh, our freshman teachers, about every eight days, they get a new class of teachers, a new class of students to show up. They've never seen those students before. So they look at their list, they look in here, everything's alphabetized. They can tell which ones uh, need special accommodations in it, and it helps with the instruction. Mm. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Good point. So uh, you have in front of you a, a PowerPoint, a copy of a PowerPoint that we're going to go over. Some of our staff members got up before the meeting tonight at the public uh, for, open forum and, and explained a few things to you. So I'm going to try to just go through this uh, and, and hit the highlights uh, without uh, getting into any detail because I only have 
12 and a half minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, we had a little more, but Trish used the other. That's right. Okay, so <laughs> this year, what we have found is at CTEI, we've had an opportunity to really uh, do more things than we've done in a long time, and we're trying to figure out, figure out why. And the reason why is because we didn't have a big outside project for one of the first times in a long time. So all of that energy uh, of our students wanting to do things uh, was really a blessing for us because now the students are working real hard right here at this campus, working with uh, different projects that uh, we've undertaken. And those projects came about through a lot of collaboration uh, with our own teachers as well as with the uh, members from the middle school so that we could put things together that would benefit uh, more and more of our students. So this was the first thing that at the end of the uh, school year last year, the mayor donated this vehicle to us. It's kind of a distorted picture here. It, it isn't as nice as, they, as the car really looks, but um, I believe it was an old cruiser. Mm -hmm. And um, our auto collision department went through it, cleaned it all up, uh, did all the touch-ups. Uh, and then Rick Votour came up, spoke with uh, our people in graphic arts, and the students made decals, and the decals are located all along the side of the vehicle here. You can see these little dots. Those are actually very colorful decals, uh, one for each one of the service departments. Uh, there's a big eagle on the hood that takes most of the hood up, a flag, very nice, and on the back it says Lemus to Veterans. And this car was given back to uh, Mr. Voltour and the Veterans uh, Administration so they could use it for functions around around the community. We're going to use it for, um, <coughs> it'll be the escort car for funerals for veterans. Excellent. So no um, matter who the veteran is, sometimes you get a World War II guy that's in his 80s or 90s, okay. very small funeral, but whether they get buried at a, um, at a, uh, in a cemetery or in Winchington or wherever it might be, they have an escort car to take them there. Nice. Yes. Yeah. They did an excellent job. When well, we used it for the uh, the wall, yes. when we brought the wall in, the healing wall, yeah. and people, I don't know how many thousand, 4,000 people, and everyone just kept commenting on that guy. Nice. We were nice. able to tell them. So yeah. we're going to do some PR for you and get it up here and take some pictures. Nice. Okay. They, did, they did an outstanding job. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So we're going to go on to the next one. Okay, uh, another thing that ended up taking place, uh, Quick story, I believe her name is Jen Mundy, came to the, came to the CTI office one day, and while she was with us, we, we, in casual conversation, we said, we used to have a middle school program, and, it, and our antennas went up, <laughs> and she was very excited about that, wanted to know more about it, and I said, dude, we've got the curriculum right here, and we went into the, uh, one of our files there, pulled out the old curriculum, and along that that, to make a long story short, uh, we then had a group of people from the middle school and a, and a group of people from our own school. We got together, we talked, we said, okay, what can we do? And the, the bottom line is, is we, we've started this eighth grade training st station out in uh, one of the garages we have at the end of the building. Uh, we asked the building inspector to come up, take a look at it, we told them what we wanted to do. Uh, our CAD students drove up, um, drew up some plans, he approved the plans, and we are going through the process of getting that ready for the 8th grade training station that we hope to start at the end of the first semester, beginning of the second semester. And there's a couple of pictures there, some people uh, on ladders doing electrical work in there, and uh, some students outside, that's a condenser, <coughs> we put a um, heat pump in there for heat. Uh, that also provides electricity, I mean, provides air conditioning in the summertime. Um, Mr. Bayshot earlier this evening told you about our efforts to start a 501c3 account. Uh, this uh, talks about it a little bit. Uh, we have made up some posters. We're going to see about putting these uh, around the city at various uh, locations. It gives a, a it tells a little bit about the STAR fund and uh, what it means and um, that we're trying to um, preserve or perpetuate the mission at CTEI. 
and having our own 501c3 account will help us to provide scholarships for students as well as build up reserves so that when some expensive piece of equipment needs to be replaced or repaired uh, we're not at the mercy of the local budget but we can reach into our staff fund and draw upon that to make those acquisitions or repairs. All of you are aware because you've been you've been following this and been voting on it of the memorandum of understanding uh, for a preferred partnership agreement with West Boylston. Uh, in, in speaking with the superintendent from West Boylston today, who's been working very closely with our own superintendent and the people in in Boston or Malden, um, that partnership has won the approval of all of the people in uh, DC. And um, that, as you can see up there on October 12th, the school committee from West Boylston approved this preferred partnership. And the superintendent there would like to ensure that the uh, preferred partnership, uh, the memorandum of understanding reads that um, we can accept anywhere from 10 to 15 students at the beginning of each year into our freshman class. Uh, on November 16th, those three people that you see there, Chris, Becky, and Kevin, and I'm not saying the last names because I can't say that last name without Kevin. That's a tongue twister for me. So those three people, the principal of the high school and middle school, the uh, middle school guidance counselor, and the eighth grade special ed teacher visited the facility here. We gave them a tour. They loved it. And um, we're going to be making arrangements to meet with them uh, fairly soon. Uh, to review the application process for the students that would like to come here. The school store. Uh, all the dates are there as to what has happened this year. Uh, and you all have an invitation to come to the opening. Uh, and that opening is planned for uh, December 19th, I believe. It's a Monday. Good morning. Yeah. And it would be right before uh, Christmas. So if you could get there, that would be nice. You see a little picture here. Uh, a lot of uh, our students worked hard to get this store going, and now they're working hard to uh, create some of the things that the articles that are going to be for sale in the store. And so if you can get to uh, the grand opening, that would be great. Uh, and we plan on opening just at lunchtime during the lunch blocks for now to get started, uh, and then we'll go from there. Cash only? Cash only? Yeah. Mm. Cash only. Yes, cash only. No, not really, but we're working on that. Okay. Let's see. It was uh, last Thursday. Uh, Mr. Primarini, Kyle Pr <coughs> Primarini from uh, the Lumista Access Television invited us uh, to his studios and I think Sandy uh, referred to that earlier. And um, up up there on the screen and on your, um, on your handouts that you have, there is a, a link on YouTube. You can go there and you can watch a 27 minute interview that took place between Mr. Bayshot, uh, Mr. Cruz, uh, Sandy Cucciara and myself, and we had a nice conversation with Mr. Primarini about a lot of different things in, involved with uh, the Lumsden Center for Technical Education and Innovation, and we talked about probably the most important thing, the idea of trying to create a, a TV broadcasting uh, program right here at CTEI. Dave, how is that going to work with the TV production course that's offered at the high school. Um, I'll address that as soon as I'm done this. Okay. okay. And then the last thing, um, we are also in the process right now of building a photovoltaic learning station behind the gym and behind the rubber gym as you come out the rear entrance of the rubber gym. And what you see in that picture is a scale model that was made by a young lady in our CAD program. That young lady worked to develop the plans, have the plans uh, retrofitted so that we were able to get a building permit. And when we first did this, 
I don't know if you can see it on the, the drawings came out, your pictures came out pretty dark, but in the middle of this opening is a post right here. Mm -hmm. And when we looked that over, we said, all right, what do we have to do to make this strong enough here so that we can don't have to have that post there? So uh, the student uh, worked on it and got in touch with the uh, building inspector and we got it all okay and um, we're going to have that built with no post in the middle so it will make for easier access in and out of the rear of the gym. Hmm. So how much time do I have left? You have five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Oh. All right. So I'm going to finish with all of that and try to answer questions. So My question is about the TV. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the problems with the TV production program, the way it's run at the high school now, is that it's just an elective. Students go in there for one period and then they leave. And then 20 more students come in for one period and they leave. And so it's very difficult for anybody to get into in-depth study of TV production. And what we need is we need to have a program like a CTI program where students go in there for extended periods of time. They can take on a project and then put some time into developing and completing the project. So the idea is not to uh, take away anything from the high school TV production, but to build our own studio here at CTEI. And we're working with Carl right now about possibilities of where that might fit. Do you see that maybe the two could merge together? <laughs> maybe. Maybe. See, one of, the th one of the things that happens is if you take that area and make it a CTEI um, program, then you reduce... Uh, 100 students a semester going in there mm -hmm. to 20 students a semester, we'll say. And then when you do that, you've got to find spaces for those other 80 students to go. And right, right now, spaces uh, space is a real tight commodity at, see, at, at the whole school. And we have no place to put those kids right now. Mm -hmm. So we, we'll, we'll be talking with Dr. Lord and superintendent about how we can make this work. We're in the initial stages right now. Yeah. Ron? Would there, in all this rolling out of all this, have you had any conversation with Pittsburgh State University, the J Media Center? Not yet, but that's a goal that we're headed to it because their, <coughs> their media production facility at Pittsburgh State is outstanding. Yes. So we, we plan on going that way. That way you can avoid dupl duplicity. Because you know, you, I think Nona was asking about how to combine those two, but if you don't have to combine those two, if you're going to be using Pittsburgh State and or Mount Washington using the the computers, yeah. you'd have everything connected. Yeah, you're right, and, and that we need to investigate that one, and we will. The other thing is how much that's going to cost. Well, we looked at uh, in a relationship with Mount Wachusett already, uh, but we didn't have the infrastructure on our end yet to be able to do anything. So uh, we'll look into Fitchburg State also. I haven't approached them yet. So. But is there any, any idea what the cost well, is? Well, no. Is we haven't gotten that far, so we'll get there. Now, as a side note, uh, just to answer you, with Mr. Primarini, Carl, he's willing to see if he can help us with the eighth grade uh, station that we're going to develop or that's just about done and we're going to see if we can get a camera in there and get some eighth graders interested in learning how to shoot film and then edit we'll see i would think it would be very popular i mm. think it would be yeah you know kids I mean, like to use their phones the they want to yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. you yeah. My mouth, we already have a cell phone we can make any kind of flipping show we want i understand so we probably have a lot of experts out there. <laughs> right. Right on board. It's going to be incredible what they're doing. Yeah. Suzanne? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Dave, did, did I hear you say West Boylston is looking to bring 15 to 20 students 10 a to year? 15. No. 10 to, 10, to 10 to 15. 10. Oh, wrote it wrong. <laughs> 10 to 15 a year. So yeah. potentially 10. that could be, let's say, 10 a year. That's 40. We could have West Boylston students in Lemonster from freshman to senior eventually after four years it's possible how's that gonna i mean again we've talked about 
are limits and making sure our students have priority over you know West Boylston so is that going to fit in to our space well, scheme I, and I, no seriously I mean I, I, I think know, I know it's a if you ask me a question that is very hard to answer uh, we we're looking to increase revenue flow within the city we're right. trying to get other people interested in vocational technical education um, as we do that will it become more competitive to get uh, to, to get to be a sophomore junior senior in CTI yes it will and I, I always say like you go to a regional vote tech school they'll take um, students in but they'll already refuse like I won't name any in, in particular but they may take 350 students in as freshman students but they'll reject 250 they don't even get a chance to walk in the door we don't do it that way we take them all give them a chance they get a chance to prove themselves some of them of their own free will say you know what I don't like this I'm good. I, I, I want to go back to an all academic schedule which we think is a good thing because they've learned that but um, to limit how many we we take as freshmen uh, because we're worried about who's going to get to be sophomores I, I don't think we're, we're doing a service to our, a good service to our students it's a competitive world Dave is there I mean at some point we're going to have to look I mean we own a lot of real estate here <clears throat> and by three in the afternoon there's nobody in these buildings any of the buildings pretty much this is a value I mean there's a lot of money sitting here I mean the potential the students you know as we begin to the whole crossover in technology and how students learn so will the, a time of day that students learn so some students you know perform better at 10 in the morning than they do at 6 in the morning I, I mean I think this is an opportunity here to leave the you know this building open you know CTEI open longer <clears throat> and see if we can't offer more classes because this whole area can't fill all the voc ed demand no and it can't react to the change and if we can't somebody else is going to come in and do it for us whether it's the federal government or one of the colleges because that's going to be the that's the trend now is exactly what we're doing only so I, I would suggest we kind of fish around and see if there's not interest somewhere from other schools or even our own students <clears throat> to utilize the space we already have we already have an entrepreneurial effort underway to expand evening classes at CTEI, hopefully starting as yes. soon as possible. Yeah. And also your next topic, which is your last topic, they're going to be talking about fully utilizing the building down the road. So, so I, like think we'll address I think like we really got to move session. <coughs> on it. And, and I don't mean waiting until nighttime. I mean, right, I mean, it's oh, no, right after so you're talking about staff here. Yeah. Yep. Right. So, Dean, are you talking you about like a staggered schedule so some yes. kids would go the car yeah. and some would come later and yeah. stay later? Yep. yep. Dean, Absolutely. you're optimizing yeah. the use of the building. And that right? might yeah. give Dean. somebody, you, you might have city employees who get out at 4 o'clock in the afternoon or DPW workers to get all the three. They could be instructors up here in welding or wherever it might be. And so you could offer a lot more in terms of a la carte. Uh, there's a gentleman in town that's looking to open a school for welding because there's a shortage of welders. Yeah, and but Dean. No Volk Tech meets that demand. Were you were you part of the double sessions? Yeah. Way back and then? And staggered. We did yeah. staggered and double. Stag yeah. <clears throat> so I took English at 5 o'clock at night or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't go over though. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I don't know. Um, no, but for some you know, students on a technical end. Yeah. You know what? Uh, and this is a good point, too, I think, that we have to consider. Even with staggered um, uh, schedules, came in at 10.30 and worked till 6 at night. To student ratio. So sometimes if you're going to... If you're going to increase the amount of students you have, you're going to have to look at getting teachers too. So um, one of the things we talked about, I, I already spoke about this to Superintendent Jolica. Uh, we're down a graphic arts teacher, and it's and it's hurting us because we can't do the things we used to do. And now the graphic arts people want to take over the running of the school store for us, which is a great thing. But we need we need that third teacher in there. So I've already um, humbly asked if we could take the money that's coming in from uh, West Boylston, the extra money that's coming in from the the tuition that we're going to get, and hire that third graphic arts teacher back. And we've already re 
done the graphic arts department, and we, by doing that, we think we can fit at least three more students into the graphic arts department with another teacher, and 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 do more things with the students. So it's sort of like with the with more a little bit more input um, to our staff members, we can take more students. But if we don't increase our staff, it's pretty hard to. We have limits from the state. You can only have so many students uh, per teacher by safety standards. So that's what we're looking at. It's a balancing act. But there is potential. <laughs> there is potential. Right. Just one quick question. Um, they released in the paper today the dropout rates. And I was surprised the, um, the vocational schools were the highest dropout yeah, yeah, they rate. they were dropout rates, but they were the uh, rates of retention. Re uh, I know, suspension, suspension rates. rates. Oh, suspension rates. Yeah, yeah, suspension rates. rates. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was dropout. No, no it was suspension. suspension. Oh, suspension but it was. And yes, the um, I was surprised. and the, and the uh, uh, vote techs were high. Nichelle, yeah, yeah Nichelle, yeah. right. Yeah. We were, where do we, we stand? In? We were we had, well, we had rate. one number, but where does like our vote school, do, do they split it out separate? I think they... This year, what is it? It was 5.4. Yes, that's a combined school, right? right. So it, it hasn't can't be been that separated much different. Um, with the state. Um, we take our that. dropout rate, we combine it with the high school dropout rate, and it goes in as one number. Right. So. No, I was just surprised, and I also was surprised the size of school was the highest. Yeah, yes. I know. Yeah, they were high. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dave, how, how much duplication is there? between what we do and, say, Monty Tech, how much replication in, in course offerings? Uh, Monty Tech has 20 programs, mm -hmm. and okay. we have 12. And how many of those overlap, you think? Um, yeah. they, they sent representatives here because they wanted to copy our HVAC program, <laughs> so they're, they're starting an HVAC program. Um, I think every other program we have, they have. Okay. And then they have. And they're adding the veterinary. And, and then they have more. Yes. Yeah. And they're adding the veterinary yeah. one. Yeah. Right. They have cosmetics, right? Yeah. Cosmetology. Yeah. yeah. They have right. Early childhood right. care development. Um, and I think they have TV production too. I think they do. Do they have a business? They do. Yeah. So, uh, so you think, in your opinion, I mean, you've been around a long time. Yeah. And just, just, your, just your opinion. You think that we can meet the demand? I mean, between us and Monty Tech, we're meeting the demand for all of the, we're meeting the needs of all the demand that's out there. No. no so that's what I'm it saying. It, it seems to me there's opportunity here. Yeah, there is. Because we have resources. Yeah. And the building goes stagnant at two, three in the afternoon. You're right. You and know? I, I think we've had that discussion. Yeah. It's too bad that the building does empty out because. <laughs> It's just sitting here. Right. Yeah. And if we could if we could figure a way to get it to be utilized more. Well, I think the school choice money that would come in as a result, it does, school doesn't necessarily have to begin at 7 and end at 2.30. I mean, there might be students who prefer to come in later in the day and, yeah. you know, learn their trade <coughs> or take their core courses during the day and then, you know, take the, the, the technical part in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just a changing world. Yes. It's a 24-7 world today. Yes, it is. We're ready to meet it, right, David? Yes, we are. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Good, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dave. All right. Last up on the uh, agenda here, uh, we have uh, the work that is uh, kind of uh, been addressed by uh, Dr. Lord in the past. Um, we've been doing a lot of work around developing the academic <coughs> support center at Lemonster High School, and it's been primarily because we have had a shift of demographics and students, um, and we've identified the fact that there's been a higher population of um, academic students that have um, needed a little bit of additional assistance as they get through their freshman, sophomore, junior year. So um, Ned has uh, kind of joined some of the uh, discussion around um, the Academic Support Center. So. Chris, I'll open it up to you and then let Ned make his comment. So thanks. Sure. Uh, this will just be a continuation of conversations of um, things you've heard about before. Um, about a year ago, I was talking with you about why our school went from level one to level two. And we discussed, as Mr. Jolliver mentioned, um, the <coughs> subgroups that are within our population are growing and they're more challenged for their <coughs> success. These are our English language learners, 
our special needs population, and our um, economically disadvantaged students. So these are the three subgroups that we're trying to get our arms around and try and get um, a way to help them. Um, study through the course of the year led us to the fact that the high school schedule needed to be modified slightly so that we could accommodate these students a little bit more successfully. So the first thing that we did um, as we built the schedule uh, through last January, February was to create an ESL program for our English language learners. Uh, we now have six teachers assigned to that ESL group. They all have common planning time. They're like a freshman team. So once a day, every day, they can sit down and talk about ESL, ESL students. The ninth grade teams have already, always been at the high school, uh, but they've only had one common planning time. Now they have two. So the ninth grade teams are able to meet twice a day if they need to, to intervene with those kids that are at risk, those ninth graders. The other thing that happened with the ninth grade teams is the, the teachers who were teaching ninth graders, because they typically tended to be the <coughs> less tenured staff, they moved all over the building. They had different classrooms everywhere. So what we did now is we've taken each of the four teams and we've clustered them right into one particular area of the building. So when the kids go to class, they go right across the hall. And there's a very tight internet type of family communication that can happen between the English, the social studies, and the math. <laughs> they're, all very, they're all very close to each other with those teams. The other part was the special needs populations. They need to be able to get together more frequently. So we established in the master schedule an opportunity for all the ninth grade special needs teachers to meet and also for the tenth grade special needs teachers to meet. All of those structures were put into the schedule as we currently have it. So this gives all these adults an opportunity during the school day to meet on these kids, decide interventions, meet parents, so the parents can meet with all of them at the same time. Uh, and then finally, uh, the study halls were all over the building. They were covered by different teachers at different times in different areas of the building. Now, all of the students, if they have a, um, a self-directed learning opportunity, it's now happening in the media center. We have an online media class. Sometimes there's 25 students, sometimes there's 60 students. There's always three or four teachers in that room to help the students during that time frame when they can do self-directed learning. The library is there, all the resources are there during that time. So the kids aren't wandering around the building as much. They tend to be a little bit tighter. There's a real sense of academic press. You're welcome to come into the building anytime and see that. Those are the structures that have been put in place. Uh, the last thing that we put in place was a teacher mentor program, and Trish Elicit, um, talked about that a little bit. Um, Homerooms were kind of randomly assigned of 25 or 30 kids in a room. Whenever we had a homeroom, there was 25 or 30 teachers that weren't assigned to kids. So after talking with the room, with the uh, union, we set up a teacher mentor program. So now every teacher has 10 or 15 students. Um, some are in CTEI, some are in the LHS side, and it's a much tighter, smaller homeroom. And the last thing we've set up is within the Aspen database, we can have a much more nimble schedule. The way the schedule was set up before. It defined the entire year on day one, is a day one through seven, and it was not very flexible. On a day like today, where we only had three classes and they had varying different lengths or periods, those had to be <coughs> randomly, they had to be scheduled, and then hand, the bells had to be hand rung for those. Now what we can do is we can actually create a bell schedule of any format we like on all the classes that we have in any pattern that we want, at any time that we want. Now we're still running the schedule as it always runs, but the flexibility is now there to put in a 15-minute homeroom if we want to on a particular day, or to drop it in the middle of the day, or to have the classes double up. I mean, whatever the community wants to do to try and improve performance or experiment with some new way to deal with the instructional time during the school day, that has been built into the Aspen schedule. So what the most important part is, and that is what this is right here, I did want to mention just one other thing uh, that our teachers did. Um, on the professional development day, our English language learners are the most challenged. So on November 8th, we had about 20 of our ESL kids come in during the PD day, and the teachers assisted those kids to get ready for the math MCAS makeup, which was the very next day. So we've got a really good committed group of teachers that are willing to help out these, these groups, and now we've got a lot of interventions in place. And the best one I think we have is the Academic Learning Center. Um, that, are you, everybody looking at this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a build on the program that was here already and met the needs of many of the students with special needs. Um, Laura, Danielle, and Jen have been working in those three classrooms for the last couple of years in a tutorial setting for students with IEPs. Those rooms were unused during the other blocks of the day. So it, where you see uh, Melissa and Gokin and Karen, Mike Still, those are people that are regular ed teachers that are available to either do a drop-in during that time frame or to be scheduled during that time frame to do a student that had some need of assistance. You ask for some results, this is part of the results. Last year, every quarter, we had somewhere between 150 and 200 students failing 
two, three, four, five, six, or all seven of their classes. So we need to do something to help out those couple of hundred kids every quarter. We've had this academic learning center in place for one term, and we're already cut that number by 40 percent. There was just over 100 students that failed more than two classes in the term that we just passed for Port Council last week. So there's some results that I think we're getting to based on these interventions for these kids in need. Our goal is to get back to level one, try to get as many supports in place as we can for these kids, and we've got just about as many as we can put in at this point. Um, if we use the uh, online media class, if we use the common planning times, if we use the academic learning center, we should be able to get our arms around those needy students and get a successful program for them and hopefully get us back up on top. Um, the academic learning center has a lot of opportunities <coughs> there. Uh, there are some needs. We talked with the staff about what they thought would be helpful. Um, there needs to be a little bit better understanding uh, about how the academic learning center um, is utilized for the academic staff and how teachers can use it. Um, they're looking for Ethernet drops to take either Edmentum or Edgenuity to the next level within that room so the kids can do online learning during that time frame. Uh, Ned will talk a little bit about how that cannot be focused just within the school day but might extend after the school day when kids can come in to the academic learning center to do that online learning. Um, if you look at all those dark numbers there, uh, Mike and Gokin and Karen, Melissa, those are all regular ed teachers. What we had to do is we had to increase the class sizes in the regular ed classes so that we could free those teachers up to put them in the academic learning center. That fourth staff member, that third bullet down, will allow a, another person to be in there. You know, it's back to the staff, kind of like what Dave was talking about. If we could have a fourth person in there that was specific to ESL, a specific for an ESL support person in that academic learning center, that would be of most value. And we could put those teachers back into the classrooms and reduce the class sizes in the academic classes. Um, testing accommodation site with a staff member. Um, IXL software, maybe you know a little bit more about that than I do. And a new course for ALC students was suggested by our staff um, yesterday on socio-emotional intelligence. Um, sounds like a lot of the stuff that's already going on at LCE. So that's where it is. Ned, do you want to fill in the blanks? Sure. So I want to jump on Dean's comments, and I think others have jumped in too, because one of the issues that I think we're facing in our school district is that we have these buildings that are not being used after school. We have tremendous facilities in CTEI. We'll be starting off at LCE and new building after the new year. Um, but still our referrals to Goodrich Academy continue to increase or at least stay the same. And we're not hitting a population of students that needs to be served. But I'm not going to talk about special needs kids, and I'm not going to talk about kids who might drop out anymore. I'm talking about our high-end learners, too. Because what's happening is, is that we have kids that want to accelerate their learning so fast. We heard some stories about it already tonight. We have kids that want to learn the trade and don't want to spend a lot of time learning academics at a particular time, or maybe want to learn it independently. We need to be able to begin to fill in these blocks with the facilities that we have and taking advantage of the programs like the, um, the um, Academic Learning Center. Really what we're looking at ultimately is serving students from 8 o'clock in the morning till nighttime. And it's not double sessions. It really is a concept of having uh, strategic courses and, and availability of courses for kids who want to use them. And I, I can't agree, Dean, more with your statement about the vocational technical areas. This is a, an untapped wealth of, of uh, resources that we can really hone in on. Now, do we have some obstacles? We absolutely do. I mean, this is something uh, really free thinking. Um, we would have to engage in long and serious conversations with our unions because it really would be outside the school day. But if we look at the, what's going on across our country, the school day is becoming very, very blurred now um, between places like LCE where we have internships and outside and externships and um, the school districts that are just offering um, full-time ingenuity or admin kinds of courses uh, popping up all over the place. So we need to be begin to harness. What's that answer? There is no answer right now. What we need to do is we need to gather the, the big brains in our district and our community and put together a subcommittee to start this. Um, we've talked about going back to LCE 
as operating as a as a really eight to eight school and it's getting there because we now have some opportunities to have more students there. But I really believe this has to be beyond LCE. It really has to be a district-wide focus. And again, you know, May, you hit it on the head. This whole vocational tactical piece is something we can tap that really is going to help all students. And that can be in currently in high school or it can be students that, that left for whatever reason and want to come back because they're working during the day. And uh, I think we really should gather together educators and community members and business people and start talking about this because this is the way to go. I, I think the other thing we, we can do is everything doesn't have to be a full year program. So say if you wanted to take, and it doesn't have to be a night course, so to speak, a night course, but yeah. if somebody is in a, in a trade, you know, they're in the, in, in the corporate world or any world and they want to send somebody to learn, you know, we have a machine that's better than theirs and they want to learn whatever it is, HVAC, whatever, you know, they want to work on this particular machine. They would pay us to bring people in so that we could offer this. So we might have to hire a trainer, but they're basically leasing our space, so to speak, is what you're doing. And, but I, I know because I've been part of these conversations, it's going to happen within, with or without us, and I just feel like we're going to miss the opportunity if we don't get moving. But I, I think probably the thing that it, maybe you could do to fast track it is, a lot of the colleges offer, you know, their students who are in their master's program or their doctorates, you know, um, a project that they do, t you know, as a collaboration amongst different divisions in the school. Maybe we can apply to them. They do a lot of legwork in terms of putting together all the pieces. And maybe they get us a little bit closer. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. everybody's busy, so it's hard to just put a group of people together and then do a regular work and squeeze in something else. But that might be an opportunity for because it's going to happen. I mean, I don't know if the governor said it today publicly or not, but I mean, one of the things he's asking is that more businesses offer more internships, especially in the areas of STEM. And he's specifically talked about um, high schools. Mm -hmm. And he wants um, them to open up their businesses to high school students because it, the rest is easy. Just get them in and sort of get them familiar with what it is that goes on and fascinated. And the rest is just easy sliding after that. Couldn't agree more. So, I mean, we have these beautiful buildings, and they're just, you know, I mean, even even for an extended day for some of our schools where maybe um, just to offer some of the online um, exposure that maybe they need in the third or fourth grade. Mm -hmm. But it takes money, and so we got to look for the other end, somebody that needs, uh, I mean, at one time we rented to Mount Wachusett, to Clark University, to, I mean, all of these places at one time rented from us. So, um, and it's not cheap for them to rent anymore. They're in some pretty expensive locations where, uh, you know, so I, I just think maybe that's a start. Universities were looking to do their masters or whatever and say, look, we got a project for, and you gotta have to, you know, apply to them and they decide whether or not they take your project, but. No, we'll start right away because we need to do it that. Certainly okay. would, it certainly would bring you closer to that implementation part. Absolutely. No. We got Trish working on it. Yeah. Back when the alternative ed program was first started, there was it was it was designed to be not the school day. It was designed to go start part way through the school day and go into the late afternoon evening to accommodate students needs of maybe they had to work or you know they can't get up at eight o'clock in the morning or they can't be here for 7 30 um, but that kind of fell by the wayside uh, because I think it involves money I think it you know it concerned a monetary value and um, as Ned said I mean there's contractual issues that would have to be resolved to do that, I'm in favor of it. I mean, the other thought is, you know, has anybody thought of trimesters versus, you know, year-round <laughs> year uh, school? We sent, trimesters, you know. We sent our guidance team to two trimester schools mm -hmm. last year. They went to North Andover and they went to yeah. Tingsboro. They both have trimesters. It's, it is a really serious solution we should look at. It gives kids more opportunities. Right. It makes the curriculum a little bit different, but. The teachers are teaching five classes now, and, and the kids are taking seven classes at a time. It's crazy. Yeah. There's no college in the world that's having kids right. taking seven classes yeah. at once. Kids should be taking four or five at a time, yeah. 
trimester facilitates that, so does the 4-4 four four block. Yeah. Can I jump in yeah. about the alternative ed program? Because um, Chris and I uh, will be engaging with Steve right after the holidays to talk about how we expand and fold into the AALC a little better, mm -hmm. um, especially with Edgenuity and Edmentum kind of blurring. So we're going to have to figure out how to do that in a way that makes sense right. financially and for kids. Um, but then also talking about the extension of the day yeah. and how but, we can do But that. I think that's why Goodrich looked attractive to struggling kids here right, right. that, you know, they it offered a different time frame than what was here. For right. all those reasons you right. said. And, yes. not, and not to right. get, not I can see Dave in the mirror behind me, so we'll, I'll say this gently. But, you know, how about, you know, evening um, vocational courses for kids that... Right. Um, really don't like the traditional daytime. No, that's what I was saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? Right. Exactly. Right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What about for adults? I mean, I, yeah. adults too. Because sure. We don't do anything because for as, as Dean yeah, was saying. You want to take a cake the place class is open or, in the evening. But you know, look at me. Look at me, guys. I graduated in high school, and then I come back and I, I find out I have to go back to school. And it was the toughest thing for me to go back to school. Because now I had to, I had to open up a flipping book, and I had to listen to a teacher after spending two years in the military. Hello. There was nothing. Yeah, but I mean, but, I mean. Right, hold, no, on, no, Wendy, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Wendy had her hand up before yeah, ahead, anybody, go so go ahead. Okay. She waited okay. patiently. Go ahead. Thank you. Wendy. So. Um, I think one of the things I wish Carrie was still here that we we see with LCE that works is the alternative schedule that not necessarily mm -hmm. the seven to three because they're doing three days a week of nine to four and it's working there and the teachers who are teaching there are okay with this too, so I I, I think that these alternate schedules and can be very successful. We just have to get people on board. There are challenges with transportation and with with the unions and those are all things to keep on the radar. But I don't think that should stop us from trying to. Um, capitalize on what we have because we have three great high school programs and we have amazing we I think we're very lucky in Lemster we have some really amazing teachers so there are challenges but I think we should not we should definitely be looking at these alternative options because we'll get more students in we'll keep more of our students we'll, we'll hit all those social emotional buzzword bu buttons and we'll graduate more successful students. And we have an adult population who could probably use night courses for retraining because that's right. something that a lot of people are struggling right. with. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I think I think that's true. I think there's an, uh, an element out there. I know my husband came back um, in his late 40s, early 50s, and took the um, plumbing course here to because he needed to get certified again to be a plumber. Right. Um, so I think these, these so are, I mean, we have the resource. We just right. have to figure out the right. best way to use them right. to make it more attractive to keep our students and to attract students in. Right. And, and looking down the road, you, you know, use the word blurred. It's exactly what's going to happen is education is going to look anything like it does now. Every student will have an internship, will only take four courses. The other three will be online. <coughs> Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. And the rest of the day is going to be in some working environment somewhere. But think about transportation. When they're uh, less and less kids are getting their license, we all ran down to the registry and got it exactly that day. Less and less young people are interested in getting their license at 16 and a half years old. They just don't care. It's not a big deal for them anymore. They'll use public transportation. Right. They'll walk. They'll use a bike. They go to the inner city. We're going to have... My son, who's 20, just got his license <laughs> last week. And that's okay. No, there's nothing wrong with that. No, it isn't. It, it, there's, not that, it, there's not that dependence upon it anymore. And it's 2600 bucks to get insurance. Furthermore, you're going to have, in five years, 10 years, you're going to have driverless cars. It's all going to change. But so right. is education. And if we don't get ahead of it, that some way, you know, we're, we're, we're at that critical point now. If we don't get into it and make it more blurred than it ever was, then we'll be the people still driving a car down the street while everybody else is passing us out with their driverless you know, automobile that parks itself and right. you tell it what to do and it does it and orders for you on You're Amazon. You're talking about Knight Rider now. <laughs> it's true though, that's what it is. The thing that is governing behavior is the internet. All the online classes, I mean, the, the, the adaptability of using either this or that, for classes, we still don't know the maximum output. You know, Principal World was saying, no kid should be taking seven classes. But you know, the thing of it is, those are limits being set by people. I'm not 
I'm not contesting you, but you're setting that limit. What happens if there's a kid or a guy who wants to take more than seven classes? You know, as I think Jim or yeah, but Jim it's not for say, everybody. Huh? It's not for everybody. It's not for everyone, but there's a terrible word, but there are some people who will do that just to, just to spite us. Not to spite, Ronnie. Not to spite. 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 It's just for them to learn spite. it. Because somebody right. says, oh, you can't do that. And somebody says, you know what? No, I'm it's not. Do I'm, it. I'm and you're going to see what's going to happen. Yeah, kid, I don't you know, think it's Ron, spite. It's interesting because the, the exchange students from Beijing said that they have to take seven courses and they have an hour for every um, of homework for every right. hour of, of every course. But what they said they like most, and I've heard this time and time again from students from everywhere, is that they like our education system better because it gives them more time, less pressure, gives them more time to study the things that they like. So when they come here, they don't study any less, but they study the things that they so, like to study. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're free now. To, to be able to study, they, they're not, they're still se studying six hours a night, but four of them are in areas that they like, that they're actually want to excel in. And that's the difference between our system and theirs, because theirs is just a point system. If you don't get a 700, you're done. You're, you're, you don't get to take the test again, and you move on to your occupation. Your destiny is already decided by your test score in your senior year, and it's right. over. It, it, so I don't think it's any less. I think people will just do you know, differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they it's just different. will learn but differently, more sure. or less, right. under no, less pressure. That's what the ILPs do too. They help students focus in on their individual learning, what right. they want to learn, how they're going to learn it, how they're going to prove they learned it, and have work product to show for that. And it, I think the days of an of all A's being an indicator of a good student are falling away and it's more of what have you learned and show me how I can tell you've learned that. Right. Well, look how many yes, learned. show me your work product because anybody can study hard one night and get an A the next day. Do you, do you remember what you learned? No. Can you can you access <laughs> that? But can you access no. that later to actually make good use of it? And that's what these this different way of evaluating students is giving us is that they're showing that because they wanted to learn this and they figured out a way to tap into that and really retain what they're learning, it's a much better indicator of what they're getting than just a good report card it's or a good SAT score. And skill -based. Yes, and this is what you were talking about. As you for heard, 23 years. And you said here a few on. meetings back talking about you were hearing from businesses in the area that a lot of those soft skills are missing, that people are coming for in, in interviews not even knowing how to talk to the person interviewing them. These are the things that we can that we can make up in this different style of learning that's happening now. And look how many schools are doing away with valedictorian, salutatorian, right. all those things, doing away with ranking class, more focusing on a project, what what um, capstone project, yeah, what application yeah. of knowledge, exactly yeah. what yes. the child has done in right. the community, service service based. And I think yeah. some of those students that end up in Ned's office looking, needing to be outplaced because they don't fit traditional learning styles. Right. And if we could be more accommodating, we'd be able to keep more of those. Would you students. all be willing right. to come to our next faculty meeting and make these exact same comments? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was another question, Chris, is, you know, I think you're, I think you have a lot of good ideas that you want to implement. I don't want them to have any credit with me. I don't care who gets credit for the no, ideas. No, they are. I'm They're just saying there. that, you, right. I mean, you've come up with it, but you need to sell it to your faculty. I want them to come up and I'm going to say, great idea. You know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I just, tried to sell I just, <coughs> I know, it's it's been a tough, yeah. it's been it's tough. Tough. Yeah, change is tough. It is but yeah, change is tough. But it, we're it's going to need to get more of the teachers into the workforce it's so they can see. Because I hear so many students when I ask them, well, how did you get interested in this? And they're like, I was in here with my father one day. Or I went to work with my mother one day. Or my father is a repairman for something. I walked by the lab and I saw them working in the lab and I wanted to know what they were doing. And that's how I became interested. That's, that's, that's real life. I hate to take away your mm -hmm. personal training sessions that you have up here with your, uh, you know, but that's probably Someone a place to go to is to take them into the workplace and see what, what goes on. And people find their passion and money is less significant, right? I think the next generation watched us fools work a billion <laughs> hours, think we needed houses that were 8,000 square feet with 37 bathrooms in them, and they watched us do that and realized that's not. <laughs> now they <laughs> want a tiny house. That, that's, yeah. Now it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> go ahead. You're going to bring up a. Um, here at LA, just to kind of do something like that, we have a career and community service learning uh, course that we offer, and you're able to go out in the community, and um, Ms. Walks works with us, and asks us, like, our interest.
some of them are doing our career and then finds us a um, place that will help us do that. Like currently, I want to I want to be a nurse, so she has me in the hospital right now, and I'm uh, shadowing nurses and seeing like how that is. And other kids are over at um, physical therapy because they want to be either physical therapists. You or still want to be a nurse after watching that? Yeah, it's a tough, tough job. Uh -huh. It is tough. There's it's about 50 kids with the uh, CTEI A yeah. B week thing. This is the LHS side of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids That's involved good. In that. And a lot of it's during the school day. There's a big group that go out last period, but there um, is some kids every period doing something that she's describing during the school day as part of Ms. Walks' community services program. So you think you'll be a nurse? Oh, yeah, I definitely. Good, good for well, you. What better, you. That's way great. To, great. what better way to find out whether you're really interested in something right. than exactly. to, to invest to that time <laughs> now if you go out in the field? Right. And you, you say, this is yeah. what I want to do. Right. It's better than investing four years worth of college mm -hmm. and then figuring out it's not what you I want wish, to do. I so. wish we had that. I, yeah. Wish yeah. Had, yeah. I still don't know what I want uh, to do. I also <laughs> feel like the, the half-day shops also encompass like the style of learning that you're talking about. Because I'm in health occupations, and I take three AP classes, and um, I have my shop. And on days where I have every period of my shop, I go out and I observe an occupational therapist up at the Samoset Preschool, and that's how I knew that, like I had some idea of what I wanted to do, but I also observed um, a physical therapist at Ramsey Rehab, and I'm observing an occupational therapist, and it's all because of like the CTE that I'm in, but I also have the opportunity to take like the more challenger classes, and I feel like, um, I don't, like you said, change is tough, but like the expansion of like half day shops might encompass what you guys are talking about. Because some days I'll come to school and right at 11, I'll be going off into something that interests me. And it's amazing how fast the day goes by yeah. because I'm here watching the occupational therapist and it really helped me figure out that that's what I want to do. And also in the shop, um, I thought I wanted to be a nurse too, but then after going to the nursing home, I realized it wasn't really for me, and I was able to find like a new career based off of that. So I really do think that the half-day shops are really important, and I feel like, um, I don't know, I feel like you guys have like this idea of like this uh, new um, way of learning, but we kind of already have one, and I'm not saying like we should. No, it's just more of more. it is what we're yeah. saying. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Right. We think yeah. that more diverse. what we're seeing needs to be expanded right, for more opportunities. Good. Yeah, I, and you. Do, you, do you agree that people, uh, that your generation cares less about monetary, uh, physical, you know, money-driven <laughs> things or, than, yeah. than the, the generation yeah. before you and more about the balance of life think, and having a, a good balance? Be careful, careful how you answer that question. Maybe a little bit, but like me personally, I don't care how much my job is. Well, that's what I'm saying, yeah. right, right, yeah. right. And there are a lot of people who that's took a good. job that are working in a cubicle off of 128 who never see the sun, they couldn't tell you it's rain, but they make big money, they have good vacation, and they got stock options, but they're miserable. I talk to them every day, they're, well, you know, they're hoping that there's some miracle and they'll come back as, you know, an actor. Yeah, we don't have any kids going out on internship into a cubicle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. It is happening. No, but the, the road's loaded with them, I hate to tell you. It's yeah. just it's the way it is. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So, what's just, our just core? For, you know what? I just wanted to um, thank the young ladies. Who yes, were thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very yeah, much. Thank you. Um, and we'll get you your line on a budget when we approve it. I do think. Um, so, when is our focus for the next meeting that we have? A, we have a regular meeting. Um, the regular business meeting right now. We have. Um, we have the results of the. Um, uh, work that we had done with K-12 Insight for the staff. I mean, it actually was a community survey that we did. We have those results. We'd like to be able to share them um, with the school committee at our next meeting. And what else did I have on the agenda? I had one other thing that I was going to discuss with Sue. So, um, so I'm, I'm interested in, I'm interested in, having the ability to offer more of these courses that are online and, and so okay. I'm interested to find out how many students might be interested either would you like them to come in sooner well, rather than later no, I, I'm just interested okay. in how do you go how would you go about finding out who would be interested in what how many it involves and what the budget would be for that okay sure only okay. because it sounds like there might be students out there that 
because of the cost part, can take some of these courses, which I really do think that there's sort of a hopscotch kind of thing. One okay. leads to the next thing, and, and it seems like a very inexpensive way to right, let's get offer the data on that. So I'd like yep. to know. Can, can, can I ask for? Could I ask for yeah, somebody's two other pieces of data that I'd like yeah, to see? Is I'd yeah, like to data. see a report see of summer out. school. Um, we in have, regard to in regard to how many how many attended summer school. You know, Daryl used to always put together a report and come and present it. He didn't do it last year. He um, we have we haven't had it in a couple of years, and okay. I think it'd be good for us to see uh, what kind of numbers it was and. Again, maybe rehear about the the number of kids from uh, the eighth grade that that had to do a summer school type program, and the other is um, class size. We had I, we had the October oh, one that. data. I gave you all the class yeah. sizes we had, last meeting, or well, two meetings ago. Right, it was in the October one yeah. thing. Had no, we had the October one things. Yeah, that was that was student attendance. I, I'm looking at class size like how many you know uh, last year we got a, a master class list from the high school um, we um, I think it was one I, of I the handouts the that we had provided was yeah. On there. yeah yeah it's broken it was out too. by school by grade right. yeah, yeah no I'm talking about the year to year comparison English oh this English class had 25 kids in it this had eight kids had in it yes we school. did yeah we did we okay. got it we got it the year we got it a year ago Yep. School. Yep. Because we had all the other grades. Yep. All right. So you want? Uh, um, okay. Right. Okay. Here's our schedule for spend the holidays. Yes. Yes. We listed yeah, all thank the you um, for that. all the school yep. events and yep. everything, and the like sponsors are on the back. There's just so many you can't check. You can't go to. I know. You sometimes too. Well. I'll I'll Nice. And Quad Graphics oh, continues to hire people from Lemonster, and they continue to be our nice. sponsor to print this up. So yeah, we thank them. Oh, thank them. you. I didn't see this. Oh. There right, and, and I made copies. Other class, I any sent copies. out an email. I sent oh, out an email. I'm sorry. Oh, do you have some? Okay, because there's some errors. Anybody need them? Yeah. No, everyone should have one. No? So, yep. Okay, and I sent out an email, and you people yes, probably I didn't get a chance, so I made copies for everybody. It's a it. um, program evaluation it, yeah. that we're looking at. So I'm thinking maybe we could look at this at finance yeah. subcommittee or something. Sure. And here you yeah, I just took a glance at it when you sent it. So. So, I have plenty of copies. Did, um, thank you. Did, thanks. All right, motion to adjourn. Motion so, to adjourn. OK, second. Okay. All those in favor? All right. Right. Did we? Did Happy Thanksgiving. Go, Thank go you. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, everybody have a great Did we send out a? Um,